the seagulls. Follow the troll. It's because they sink sardines. Will be thrown into the sea. Thank you. And uh, as we say now in my country, uh, they brought the buzz and they left the buzz in front of the goal. And um, the guy's talking absolute nonsense. Never heard so much rubbish in my it's life. Normal men. What do you mean, normal men? We're just innocent men. <laughs> I tell you, don't back down, double down. Don't back down, double down. <laughs> Welcome along. It is Friday night, and of course, you know what that means. The eagle eyed ones in the chat will have spotted a little subtle difference in the intro tonight. We've now got Josie talking about parked buses and speaking of parked buses. This bus is now rolled up to the stop, and we are parked and ready for you to get on board because it's time to go time traveling. We're going back to 2015 16. We've already done Ronnie's first season, so we're going to cap off Ronnie's time at Celtic and do his second season where. The wheels definitely come off the dialer bus, unfortunately. Uh, we'll be dissecting that later on. But yes, as you can see, tonight's team that's joining me, I've got, of course, Canada's favourite Tim. He's got the horns behind him as well, just like last night. If you position yourself a wee bit further over, Liam, they'll be absolutely perfect. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, welcome aboard again, my friend. Uh, how are you doing? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Thanks for bringing the bus around uh, this part of the world, Pacific Northwest. <laughs> it's always nice when... I get a wee detour and I see it coming over horizon about 10 to 1 o'clock my time. I look forward to this all week. It's great. And again, it's a big tardy, I say, a bus. I love the time travelling, Phil. And <laughs> I, it's, it's good. So I'm looking forward to today because this, this was an interesting season. Like there was a, For something that didn't really, when we didn't have range in that, there was loads that happened this season. So I think it'll be good to get into it, both good and bad. Oh, I definitely. As I said at the start when we began doing the Celtic years, I'm not going to not going to shy away from the the rubbish seasons. This is one of those uh, kind of in the middle ones. Right. But spoiler, all's well that ends well. How this season ends, there's a, a rather uh, a massive high point to end the season on. But again, we'll get to all of that. But of course, Steve O's that's AC Milan top giving me giving me a run for the money with the retro tops on. But that's a belter, mate. A few people in the chat already saying that about yeah. the Milan top, absolute belter. Can't wait, yeah. Steve O, how are you doing tonight, mate? Good, mate. I um, good to be back. And as I always say, I love the I love the show, I love the nostalgia. It was my previous to doing this was my favourite show of the week. So. What a better time to come back than on the bus, nostalgia. Oh, good stuff, mate. Good stuff. Well, you're and of course, my spirit it. animal Williams here as well. So it's win win, isn't it? It is, mate. It is, uh, the exactly. wise man, as I always say, wise man. Preaches right. some knowledge tonight, old wise man. 
It's happened. Ah, you did fall in there. We could do that. Good. Right. It's stuff. Good stuff. So before we get. <laughs> No, I mean, I'd say I'll learn something new for you every single week on this show. Whenever we're off camera, before or after the show, I always learn something interesting. I'm like, this guy, man, this guy, honestly, the stories this guy's got. But anyway, we'll uh, do all the good stuff before we get into it. So as usual, folks, I'll remind anybody, if they are new to the bus and they've just discovered us, then why not hit that subscribe button? Go on, why not? We're stopping you. It's free of charge. And obviously hit the bell notification to obviously find out when we go live. And we do go live quite a lot. Of course, hit that like button. Helps us massively with the old algorithm. Uh, get involved in the comments tonight. Because again, you know, we always enjoy it on Nostalgia, hearing your memories of this. And once again, I've put a little uh, a little poll in the, uh, the comments tonight. So please get involved in that. Tonight's question is a very simple one. Whose side were you on after the meltdown in Mulder? Chris Commons or Ronnie Dyler? We will get to that, of course. That'll be one of the major, major talking points. But yeah, I've put it out there. I've not put, I've not put any middle ground in there saying, eh, I kind of saw both sides. No, no, no. Chris Commons or Rory Dyler, which one were you siding with on it? And uh, yeah, of course, share the link of the Boise Bus on any social media platforms you wish. And of course, a big, massive shout out to our sponsors, PiSports.com. Uh, so far, it's been an absolutely fantastic relationship with them. Very, very popular. Yeah. We've all indulged in the old, uh, the old pies this week, the macaroni pies. I've been uh, scoffing them. Steve, you did a whole video scoffing pies as well, which went down a tree. It's like I OD'd on pies, are not it? I'm glad I thought you were half drinking out. <laughs> But yeah, plenty of people uh, gave that a watch and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it, mate. So yeah, it was very well done. But uh, yeah, again, with PiceBoss.com, folks, head over to the website, get an order in there, folks, and uh, tell them that the bus sent you. And you can do that by using the code BUS1888. You've got a nice 12.5% off. So yeah, get involved in that, folks. And of course, this good stuff keeps getting bigger and bigger every week. I uh, need to remind everybody that the Boise Bus... Football shirts are on sale now. Yes, there it is again. Topper. Looks fantastic. It is a topper. A topper, of course, modelled on the classic Bumblebee kit, but mixed up a wee bit with the 2012-13 season. Uh, it's for well, everyone who loves the Bumblebee kit, the neon yellow and black. It's a wee close-up of the badge. And, of course, don't bag Dune, double Dune. One of the forces of the bus. But, yeah, uh, I've also get your order in there. It's uh, crookedarm at ymail.com. You just send your PayPal order to that and then send a follow-up email to the same email. Uh, and Russell will get everything sorted for you. Obviously, let him know size, delivery address, and so forth. He will get it all sorted. And, uh, yeah, as far as I know from the reactions in the chat over the the last few shows, obviously, it's going down pretty well and orders are coming in, so make sure that you get yours in there too, folks. Now, what else do I need to do part of the good stuff? Oh, yes, of course. I can't let you away without any trivia tonight. Oh, yes, there has to be some. There has to be something to get the, get the mind going to start the show. Of course, we'll come back to the answers at the end. So tonight's trivia, guys, we have a nice one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten answers. Ten answers to this one. So during this season, 2015-16, that we're talking about, something rare happened. Motherwell came to Celtic Park and beat us in a domestic game at home. We don't usually lose home games. So I want you to tell me all the teams from 2010 to present day who've beat us in a domestic game at Celtic Park. You may be surprised at some of the answers. There are 10 who've done it. So that's what I'm looking for. But Motherwell, I'm giving you as a free base. I'd make it 11, but there's 10 others. But yeah, Motherwell were the, the team that beat us at Celtic Park this, this coming season. A shite of their game, as far as I remember as well. An absolute shocker. <laughs> Louis <laughs> Moult scored a brace that day, but a shocking game. Shocking. But yeah, we shall uh, we shall get into it. So we haven't done a season one in a wee while. It's always been like uh, special episodes that I've been doing. Uh, keep that going, but yeah, I have to get back on the season trail because I've not got many seasons left, and we're getting to the end of this season. So yeah, here we go, 2015 and 16. As always, I will start with what was going on around about that time at the start of the season, summer of 2015, a place that we've not actually visited yet, Liam, in our nostalgia adventures. We've not landed in this one yet because it's an odd number year. You know, all the World Cups and Euros that we've done, you know, it's always going to be an even number. But yes, yeah, summer of 2015. So, as usual, always go over the uh, big football winners to start it off in the Champions League in 2015. It wasn't won by Real Madrid, who seem to win it all the time, but it was another Spanish team. It was Barcelona. They beat Juventus uh, 3-1. 
in Berlin, it was uh, Rakitic and Neymar and Suarez that scored the goals. Rakitic had also won the Europa League the year before with no, no prizes for guessing. Seville, he'd uh, captained it that day and goes to win the Champions League the next season by Barcelona. But speaking of Seville, of course, they did win the Europa League. So again, if you're going to guess... Or who, who won the Europa League in this particular year? Seville is always a good one to guess, but they beat Dnipro. Do you remember Dnipro, Ukrainian side, in 2015? Yep. Yeah, they had a quick rise to fame. And just as quickly as they, they uh, rose to the top, guys, they quickly disappeared because they're now dead. They're dissolved. They're liquidated. They ceased to exist. They are <laughs> at the end. 2019, yeah, they went to the wall. And funny I love enough, a good liquidation. They have to come back. Funny how that works, isn't it? Liam? <laughs> Some places. He could have came back as did the Nipro. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Why they um, are oh, oh, liquidation is good. It's good. Aye, aye they've uh, they've basically ceased to exist. Apparently it's all to do with uh, financial irregularities around the owner who was a bit of a dodgy one. But yeah, they uh got to the final in twenty fifteen and lost three two to Seville and then within four years after that do not cease to exist anymore the Nitro. so there you go that's uh the story of them um but yeah a few people obviously jumping on the holding company and so forth uh i was at the club of the company i, I don't know i don't even know anymore that as i say they could have come back as did the Nitro, the Nitro 5088 i don't even know but they could have done something but yeah apparently they don't even exist in 2021 they applied to start a new club in the low leagues of the ukrainian leagues and they said no Funny that, isn't it? <laughs> Ukrainian <laughs> FA, like, no, you can't go away. So, ah, there you go. The Dnipro brand can't be strong enough. That's, that's all that. Be. No, it can't. <laughs> they, need, they don't need a strong Dnipro in the Ukraine. That's, that's what they decided then. They don't need it. Uh, but around the rest of the continent in the major leagues in England, Chelsea won the title under Jose Mourinho. They beat Manchester City to the title by eight points. Something of note that season, though, is at halfway through the season, at Christmas time, usually the team that is bottom of the league at Christmas usually gets relegated. It didn't happen this time. Leicester City were bottom at Christmas time in 2014-15. Uh, they would go on a nice wee run and end up finishing 14th, and they would continue that momentum into the next season because in a year's time, they would be the champions of England. But yeah, Leicester survived that season under Nigel Pearson, then sacked him, brought in Claudio Ranieri, and yeah, magic happened the next year. They ended up winning the title. Uh, the FA Cup was won by Arsenal. They made it two seasons in a row winning the FA Cup after going about nine years without a trophy. They smashed Aston Villa. 4-0 in the final, and the League Cup was also won by Chelsea that season. I remember it being an absolutely dreadful final against Tottenham. They beat them 2-0 at Wembley. So, of course, 2014-15 season, we won the title. We uh, finished a whopping 17 points ahead of our nearest challengers, who are Aberdeen. So, Ronnie picked up the title yeah. in his first season. Uh, the League Cup was also won by Ronnie as well, as we covered in the 2014-15 show that we did. It was actually Chris Commons, contentious point tonight. He scored, and so did James Forrest, who we talked about just a few weeks ago. That was one of the many finals, League Cup finals, that he scored in. But yeah, the Scottish Cup, <laughs> Liam, was a bit of a contentious one, because as we say, Ronnie could have got himself a nice wee treble until Josh Meeking's hand just decided to swat the ball away. On the line, um, we talked about it at the time, but again, just how different things could have been. That goes in. Celtic go on and win that game. They would have been 2-0 up at that point. Meekings would have been sent off. And um, yeah, on to the final, we would have played Falkirk. So you've got to fancy we would have won that. How yeah. different history could have been, Liam? Oh, uh, you know, swings and roundabouts, you know, sliding doors, as Russell says, right? I, th I mean, it would take all the press off him. I mean, he's getting a bad run at that point as well. Like, even though he was winning stuff, because of all the commotion which we're going to go into, everything about Ronnie was questioned at that point. And again, mm -hmm. as well, should have still done enough to win that game. I think we did. I thought we played poorly that game. But again, you know, one decision can change the game and that completely took the sting out. He gives that as a penalty, which it rightfully should be. That's a different mm -hmm. game. You're up in the ascendancy. That's it. We've got it. Falkirk, I don't think we'd had a problem with. But no. I, it was just one of the games we just couldn't seem to get it in gear. No rhythm. Yeah, no. it was, it was, a, it was a, I was at Hamden that day. And we started half time. I think we won 1 0 up at the break. No, it could have been 2 0. It was uh, still in the first half that incident happened. By early in the second half, we ended up getting Craig Gordon sent off. And uh, yep. Lucas Zalewska comes on, and usually things don't end well when Lucas Zalewska was in goals for Celtic, and that was another one of them. But yeah, what's your 
Uh, I imagine your memories are pretty bad of that one, Steve, as most of us are, but yeah, it's a, it's a horrible uh, moment. And I think I said at the time when we did that show, one of the things that really grinds my gears is Josh Meekins kind of now wears it like a badge of honour when he gets yep. brought up on social media. He's always kind of like, I so what? I did it. No, it's like, oh, oh, bastard. <laughs> Aye, it was yeah. it, it's it sticks in the mind a lot because I actually had hospitality for that. Mm. So my good lady had bought me two tickets for hospitality for my birthday, which was um prior to the game, and I went with my old man and we had the whole full day, you know, bar, three course mm. meal, full shooting match. And I remember when we were there, it was quite interesting because we were the seats that we were in were almost like a press box. So nice yeah. comfy seats, but they had like a telly in front of them the game run on it which was pretty cool mm -hmm. and um i remember i remember obviously she says the instant and it's still in the day i can't well i know the answer because it's just cheating into it right but <laughs> that was when we were sampling remember the extra officials the on the line yep. and I, yep. I can't remember who it is is it mclean and he's actually bent over with his arms on yep. his knees mm. looking at it <laughs> it's, it's wild mm. it's like of all the decisions that have been so blatant in yep. front of someone that's been ignored it is it's light years ahead um, and needless to say it kind of served the day but me and my old man just went and got absolutely slaughtered and, and had to get pick, yeah. picked up for the pub later on that night so we made the best of that <laughs> situation that's it i think it i know it was mclean in dallas i can't remember who was the man in the middle and who was the one on the the sideline but it was they two referees were basically involved in the incident but I think I said at the time when we did that show, I always found that whole experiment to be hilarious where they had the extra guy yeah. behind the goal. Because I don't remember at any point in any game across the continent any of those referees ever making a big call and ever no. doing anything of no. use. And I used to always laugh when we'd have a European game at that point and they would obviously we didn't do it domestically. We trialled it in the Scottish Cup, but we didn't do it for domestic games. But we had the Europa League game. We would have the extra linesman. And it'd be funny because you'd see the, the lines, the actual linesmen with the flag and the referee doing the warm ups at the start of the game. They're running the length of the pitch. But these extra linesmen would just do little running exercises from the corner flag to the goalpost. And it was like, why? All you do is stand there the entire game. Yep. You don't need to run for anything. And you don't, do, you don't decide anything. I genuinely cannot remember a single time that a referee across the continent did you know, one bit. The, the fact the fascinating thing about it was as daft as it is now to look back on it and have these extra officials essentially on the goal line it should have worked like it, yep. it should have worked it should have had a massive impact on so many games but then case in point that they, that game there yeah. the most blatant thing and they got it wrong so Aye. what was the point it's one of the great Aye. field experiments in football Aye. isn't it I think it came, because we've covered a few of the obviously World Cups and Euros, you had the instant at the 2010 World Cup where Lampard's goal crossed the line, right? And obviously there was a huge outcry for goal line technology. I just think FIFA and UEFA didn't want to invest in technology, so they decided to trial this referee thing. And I remember at Euro 2012, which we covered, Ukraine scored a goal against England that clearly crosses the line. John Terry hooks it off the line, but it's behind yep. it. But there was one of those linesmen right there at the post, and it's like he missed that as well. So I think after that, you know, over the next couple of years, we instanced that just kept mounting up. They went, okay, fine, we need to go down the route of uh, goal line tech, which evolved into VAR eventually. I think it was just a, from a reluctance from FAs, just didn't want to go down the technology route. But when you're making blatant, blatant mistakes like that, it's got to happen. But sadly, as we talk about many, many times on the show, talking about modern-day Celtic, we're still finding ourselves in a, a position where we've got technology and it still isn't good. Still doesn't yep. work, but that's another story. This is the this is the time-travelling show. When we're talking about modern-day shows. That's a, that's a topic for their old VAR. But, yeah, this is the, the early signs of it, where it's like FIFA and UEFA's resistance is starting to break <laughs> at this point in time. Uh, but yeah, see, Ronnie cheated out of a treble essentially, but still two trophies out of three. It's no bad going. It's a decent start. And it's a good platform going into the next this season. We're about to cover uh, around the rest of the continent. All the big leagues that are absolutely no surprises at all in any of them. Barcelona won it in Spain. Juventus won it in Italy. Of course, Bayern Munich won it in Germany. PSG in France. Benfica in Portugal, and PSV Eindhoven picked it up in the Netherlands. So. Top transfers of the summer. I always go over this, although I've taken out the whole top 10 thing and going over prices because transfer market cannot be trusted. But the major yep. stories, uh, safe to say this transfer worked out pretty well. Kevin De Bruyne joined Manchester City that summer from Wolfsburg after 
a lackluster time at Chelsea. He went to play for Wolfsburg for a couple of years. They actually finished second that season of Bundesliga. He then makes a big money move to Man City. And I say, it's safe to say that one's worked out all right for him, guys, because he's easily one of the best midfielders in the world to this day. Uh, obviously, City as well, still spending the cash. They brought in Raheem Sterling and Nicholas Otamendi for big bucks that summer. Uh, hot Argentinian prospect Paolo Dybala left Palermo to join Juventus. Angel Di Maria ended his nightmare time at Man United and uh, headed to PSG. But Man United also brought in Memphis Depay, Anthony Martial and Morgan Schneiderlin for big money. That's Morgan right. Schneiderlin. I remember that one. Southampton. him. <laughs> I know. That was a weird one because usually Southampton's players would always just end up at Liverpool. But I wonder about this time Man United signed uh, Shaw. And Schneiderlin, I think Shaw might be the next season, but uh, I, Morgan Schneiderlin, turned up at Man United for a few seasons and uh, quickly. Quite a quickly random time, out. though, wasn't it? With some of the signings, a bit, a bit it peculiar. Was. It was, it was, it was. Uh, that's one I didn't see coming up. I see Memphis Depay should have probably done better at Man United. Yeah. Martial's still there now and gets games from time to time, but I don't know. It's always felt like I remember at the time they signed Martial, who's such a hot prospect, but now it's like I don't think he's ever really. Made it to the level. Oh, that he's he's never really shown any much. He's had wee flashes of brilliance, but mm. he's never looked like a guy you could hang your hat on and bring on. I don't think he just, I, I don't really know what he's meant to be, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that no, totally. And he's also had a loan spell away for the club and came back. Usually, mm. when a first team player goes out on loan and then comes back, it's like really hard for them to kind of establish himself again. So, I don't know what's going to happen with Martial, but he's probably still you know, a lot younger than I remember because I think when he signed for United, he's, he's only a teenager. He's really young. Well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's probably still in his mid-20s at this stage. Uh, my nice big rivals, Liverpool. Here's an interesting contrast. He signed Roberto Firmino that summer, who's obviously been one of their best players over the last few years. They also signed Christian Benteke that summer, who <laughs> didn't quite work out. Did score an amazing overhead kick, I do remember, against Man United that season in the, the Premier League. Now, here's an under-the-radar sign at the time, although they did spend big on it. It was about £30 million they spent. But in the grand scheme of things at the time, not many people batted an eyelid. Hyun Min Song joined Tottenham that summer from Bayer Leverkusen. It's a decent Great bit team. of business because he's, yeah. he's a brilliant, brilliant player. And uh, in one of the strangest sort of deals that was going on at the time, uh, Radamel Falcao went to Chelsea on loan after being at Man United on loan the season before. The theory was it was some sort of way for Monaco to get around financial fair play rules because he was on such an obscene wage and FFP had only just come in at that time, as we've seen over the last decade or so. Whenever a team does kind of get pulled up for financial fair play, you either don't really do much about it. There's never any serious threats or sanctions. A wee slap on the wrists and a fine for a club that's got lots of money anyway. Yeah, that's it what make do. But I do remember the Falcao stuff where he went to Man U on loan and then ended up at Chelsea on loan the next season. And both seasons, he was absolutely... Ah, it, it never really worked, did it? And, and you can't... You look back in Falcao and what a player. Mm. And I don't know, was it was he just sort of coming to the end of his time? Was he just the wrong system? You know, was mm. he loan confidence? I really don't know what happened in any of those two spells for him. Aye, he you know, was maybe a bit injury mental. prone, maybe. But I, there was definitely... Some sort of FFP shenanigans because he was on a stupidly high wage as well. And I think they just had to kind of move him aside to get him off the books or some other team to pay part of his wages. And uh, Liam, just really, really quickly, a couple of people in the chat are asking, see the pictures that are behind you? Who are they of? Because right. people are trying to guess and say, Johnny Yoko's definitely in one of them. All right. Just, just Drummer's the other one. Just ah, Drummer. Oh, okay. The other one. Right, okay. Shepherd, Shepherd Fairy Prince. I didn't do Aye, okay, no. <laughs> no, I just seem to call them yeah. I, a couple of people like uh Michael's asking like um the pics above Liam's head and so on. He's saying I see John and Yoko. But I have a few people uh, other than the horns behind your head, people have also noticed the pictures as well. But I see people just asking there. I'll so I would <laughs> no, I don't need to change them up, but just I'd seen them at the corner of my eye, I thought I'll ask them and uh put the put the curiosity <laughs> and end on that one. Um so Aye. yeah, that's so he... No, so I, so I would ask and just put the sort of curiosity at the end on that one oh, right, if people yeah. were asking in the chat. Uh, no, um, but, <laughs> no, no worries, no worries, man. But yeah, the that's in terms of the big transfers uh, of what happened in the summer. So a couple of pop culture and news headlines to go over as I normally do. So when the season kicked off, 1st of August 2015, Celtic beat Ross County that day 2-0. Number one in the charts was... Black Magic by Little Mix. Number one in the albums chart was the Chemical Brothers. They were back. I didn't even know they had an album in 2015. 
uh, Born in the Echoes was the, the album title. And number one at the box office on that particular day was Disney Pixar's Inside Out. But the very next day, it would get knocked off the top of the box office chart by Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Tea in the Park 2015, the headline acts for the three nights were Kasabian, of course, because every time I go over, the headline acts yep. at these festivals from 2004 onwards, Kasabian are always there at one of them. I didn't really think about it because I was quite liked Kasabian, but I think it was Russell pointed out on the show. He says, by this point, they've just kind of become a sort of karaoke band. It's just like, turn up, play the great hits, point your mic at the crowd, let them all sing along with you, and then that's you back down the road. Yep, but Kasabian were there at Tea in the Park on the Friday. Avicii headlined it on the Saturday night, and Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds headlined the Sunday. Other big names who appeared at Tea that year were Libertine, Stereophonics, The View, George Ezra, David Quetta, The Prodigy, Catfish and the Bottle Men, Mark Ronson, Fatboy Slim, and The Proclaimers even appeared at Tea in the Park that year. Glastonbury, the headline acts on the three nights were Forrest the Machine, Kanye West, before he went off the deep end, uh, and The Who. <laughs> Headlined in the Sunday night, but again, <laughs> Kanye may have always been off the deep end, who knows? But if I remember right, it was early in his career, he didn't seem too mental. But nowadays, oh, stay oh. away, stay away from Kanye. <laughs> Just don't even, don't even don't even don't try. oh, god, unbelievable! What an absolute oh, he's, he's just went cool. <laughs> out there, and he's he has, he is well, right out there. I hope but the he goes. I hope he ends up buying Celtic. I think that would be the best thing he could probably do. Oh, my money. God. <laughs> we'll we'll, see we'll probably right. fan own potentially I... last night on the TNF. Oh. Imagine that. Imagine Kanye. Oh, Jesus. Oh, oh man. No, no. That would be a disaster. <laughs> Pie, yeah. Ethereum. Pie. <laughs> it's probably a bit more. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a bit more lively, isn't it? But I don't know if it's aye, definitely by headlines, probably the wrong type of headlines. But I, Jesus, man, I see some of the stuff uh-huh. that he's been up to recently just doesn't even yeah. think about it. It's best, it's best to body swear, but yeah, definitely, definitely. So, the Who headlined the Sunday night, also at Glasgow that year. Libertines were there, Paul Weller, another name that always pops up when I do the recaps of the. The festivals, it's almost like we've got a guy on the show that always gets called Paul Weller when he's getting a little Twitter pile on. It's almost like it's just meant to be that his name always comes up. Uh, we've got Pharrell Williams, Motorhead also appeared, Lionel Richie, Mary J. Blige, The Water Boys, The Chemical Brothers, Mark Ronson and Franz Ferdinand with some of the other big acts at Glastonbury. As for news headlines in uh, 2015, unfortunately, the fucking Tories won another general election. Why do you keep doing this, England? Fuck's sake. Uh, I've mentioned this before on the show, and again, it's one of the big mysteries. The FBI, you know, based out in the USA, a country who don't really care about football, soccer, conducted a massive uh, investigation of FIFA. And in 2015, they uh, raided the FIFA offices. There was wide-scale corruption found. Lots of arrests were made. Sepp Blatter stepped down in June of 2015. It was all around, you know, uh, money, um, bungs and stuff like that. The 2018 and 2022 World Cup, around those ones, like the, the bidding for it. But yet, here we are now in 2023, and both those World Cups went ahead in Russia and Qatar. Because I thought in 2015, when that happened, I was like, well, surely... The outcome here is both of those countries are going to lose those World Cups. But no, nope. it still happened. But yeah, Seb Blatter stepped down as president in June of 2015. And I think Platini, he was UEFA head, wasn't he? Or was he FIFA? Because he was also involved in it as well. Yeah. I, it's just, I it's, it's no surprise, is it? Mm. No surprise. As you say that, I don't think they should have went ahead. But there you go. Aye. Money Did. is mightier than morals. Uh, it, is, it is definitely in FIFA. But yeah, see, so June 2015, he uh, steps down from his position. Well, that it might have been awarded, to, might have been awarded to the USA and Canada as well, just out of, uh, you know, mm. we felt they deserved it. You know, that might have been part of the deal as well. It's like, all right, so we'll do the next mm. one. Yeah, you know, the, the, look it up. I, I don't know if you you've heard as well, it? but there's a real threat about Saudi Arabia hosting the 2030 World Cup. Have you heard about that one? They're yep. apparently All going right. to be bidding there, and there's supposedly the Cristiano Ronaldo deal for him going out there. Part of it is once he actually retires, he'll become like an official ambassador for the bid for Saudi Arabia, which would involve another Winter World Cup. <sighs> no, nope. no. In the bin. Please, in the bin, will you? Yeah. That big bin yeah. that you were talking about a few weeks ago, Steve, will just walking around with it. In the bin. In the bin, you go. Cody's <laughs> fly and eight bins in the bin. <laughs> Get in the fucking <laughs> bin, will you? But yeah, that's... Uh, that's my fear that's going to happen again, though. Hopefully not. 
So what else happened in 2015? Yeah, following his sacking from the BBC and Top Gear specifically, Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond and James May were unveiled by Amazon Prime in July of 2015 as having signed a multi-million pound deal to produce a new Top Gear-esque show with a bigger budget called The Grand Tour, which would launch in 2016. So that was when that was announced. Uh, the social media stranglehold really set in in 2015 because Facebook passed its 1 billion user mark in the year of 2015. And here we are, we still find ourselves very much in the grasp of the old uh, social media boom. And uh, even though, that was unfortunately a tragic note, even though it wasn't in the summer of 2015, which I'm always focused on, but probably one of the biggest stories happened later in the year. And unfortunately, as I do with these shows, it always feels like whenever we do a season, it's any time after 2001, there's always one of these in the news. It was another terrorist attack. This is the one in Paris where the gunman, uh, unleashed a rampage outside the Stade de France and then went through the streets of Paris and I believe they basically crashed a theatre uh, with a concert going on and just... Turned at the Bathic one, was it not the... Um, it's Queen's of Stone Age, their spin-off band, is it not? Uh, I think it was, yes. Eagles, Eagles of Death Metal. Eagles of death metal. Yes, yep. yes, All that right. does, I. Yep. I but it was, it was that one. I mean, I hate to say when you're going about it, it's that terrorist attack because there's been so many. We have to refer to this, oh, it's that one because it just tells you how many there is. But yeah, it was, uh, unfortunately, it, they tried to originally get into the stadium. I think France were playing Germany in a qualifier or a friendly or something. And they tried to storm the Stade de France but couldn't get in and then basically ran through the streets of Paris and just caused havoc. In the end, um, 130 people were killed and 416 were injured. Wow. I say it wouldn't be, wouldn't be the last one because we've already done, we did the uh, Euro 2016 show we did and uh, just after Euro 2016 finished, that was the terrorist attack where the driver of a truck plowed through people on the beach or the beachfront of Nice in the south mm -hmm. of France, and again, right. it's that thing where you're saying it's that one because there's multiple now, and it's like it's, it's fucking tragic, man. But France it feels like it's heavy a... for a while, didn't they? Like France was, you know, it's a bit, a bit off limits to be fair. You know, my, my, my missus loves France and mm. refused to go anywhere near it for long periods, yeah. Understandable. Uh, it was um, it's one of the countries that's had it pretty bad. But yeah, as I say, it's became a sort of staple. Never do nostalgia and do any season. It's after two thousand one. There just seems to be when I do the news headlines, some sort of terrorist attack. Sadly, and uh, yeah, that's what happened in twenty fifteen. That was the biggest news story. But now moving on to what we were up to to prepare for this season, Ronnie's second season. So. And let's talk about investment. Let's talk about transfers at Celtic. Always, always a contentious point. Oh, God. So, Liam, how does this hit you for a killer's row of uh, investment? Because keep in mind, we've got a free hit at it again because Rangers aren't there, and we'll get on right. to why they're not there in a the moment. But Celtic now are like, right, we're going to win the title. It's, it's going to happen. So let's try and invest and be ready for the Champions League qualifiers. Here's what we did, though. We brought in Dedrick Boyata. Saidi Yanko, Logan Bailly, Nadia Chifty, Scott Allen, Ryan Christie, who would then go out on a loan, <laughs> and Jozo Siminovich would all join on permanent deals. All right, I'm all right. It's going to be bad the, turn there. The one loan deal that we brought in was Tyler Blackett from Manchester United. Liam, oh. how does that make you feel? Were you confident? <laughs> well, underwhelmed, to say the least, and that. I mean... I mean, some of them, I just didn't know any anything about them. Tyler Black, I'd never heard of before. Sandy Janko, never heard. I mean, it was Jason Denier was the other one. It was that one, Jason Denier. Jason Denier was the season before we brought in Boyata. This oh, season, Denier didn't he stay, we brought in Boyata instead. Right. So Boyata, I remember seeing him playing for Manchester City. Because I remember he had a couple of games. I remember seeing him mm -hmm. playing with, um, with company, I think it was it. And so, okay, that looks good. High hopes for him. But again, I, I can't even remember <coughs> what signings we were. People on the bus will know. But there was other names out there that we were getting tied to, which would be a much better fit for Celtic than taking in a lot of these just... You know, it's, it's like when Gordon Strachan was picking Scotland teams. He would rather mm. take an unknown Scottish player for the depths of England or, you know, somebody's reserve team, you know, than what was playing in front of him or, you know, like a recognised name. And I think that was the thing. It was like... Oh, they were coming from Man City or Manchester United reserve, so they must be good, you know. And that's what it felt like. And I, and I, it just didn't seem like 
didn't seem like they had trust in uh, Ronnie Daly at, at that point then mm. to maybe let yeah. him go because you wonder how much I say he had any players. Do you think Definitely. he had a say? Um, but see the 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 worrying bit about this, Liam. When you look at it with the the prices that they paid, when I looked up on Wiki, of you've got the whole undisclosed fees and stuff like that. The only player that appears that we forked out any money for that window was a Jozo Suminovic, who was a late signing in the window to replace Virgil Van Dijk, who left after we uh, capitulated in the Champions League qualifiers. But mm. um, Steve Suminovic, yeah, I just saw you giving it the. He was okay on his yeah. day, but it was keeping him fit was a problem, wasn't it? I, I mean, listen, to look at what you just read out there, I just took a wee bad turn. Just <laughs> took me back, it all went black and white, and it was all grainy, you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I listen, it's, it's not hard to put uh, Semenovic just, you know, the top of that pile there. Certainly, you know, he showed, he showed some real promise, I, I, in some respect, I'd say very similar to Abenkovic when we had him on loan, and mm-hmm. that he had on paper pedigree, he looked apart, he could play a bit of football, and just couldn't keep him fat. But oh, some of the Aye. other names, geez, oh, I mean, Aye. it's it's, <laughs> it's frightening. I mean, I, see, see what Liam was saying about getting some guys in that were further, um, sort of down south, and they were maybe off, you know, cast offs. Mm. Potentially, I'm thinking that the thinking there is, apart from being cheap, because you know with no real great competition, they're maybe thinking these guys are guys with potential, but it's just not going to harm at that bigger club. Get them in, yeah. we can develop them, turn yeah. them into something. So, you know, on paper for for where we were, it wasn't the worst idea, mm-hmm. but it needed to be supplemented with more quality, just rather than all these kind of projects. But yeah. you know what, it, it, it turned good in the end, didn't it? I well, it did, but just going over the names like obviously Morning's are saying boy and other Ambrose utter shite. We <laughs> went from the season before where we had Virgil van Dijk and uh, Jason Denier as our two centre backs to this season where we had Suminovic, who was an injury case, Boyata, Ambrose, Tyler Blackett, and occasionally Charlie Mulgrew might have played at centre back, but this was his final season with the club as well. That's what we went from from Virgil van Dijk and Denier to that. Uh, talk about downgrading, Jesus Christ, that was a, a massive, massive downgrade. Uh, Liam, here's a question for you. Uh, Do you think we signed Scott Allen purely to stop Rangers from signing him that summer? Because he was strongly, strongly liked. It was well known that he was a Rangers fan. There was a lot of talk that they were going to sign him. And uh, obviously it didn't happen and we swooped in there at the last minute. I believe we sent somebody on loan as well as part of the deal. Might have been, was it McGeerk as well? went to them as part of the deal to sign him but Scott mm. Allen I was not that fussed about getting him it was one of them, my, my thought at the time was we are doing this just to stop them from signing him, um, but yeah he never never kicked on at all did he? I mean that was a rumour I'd hate to think that that's what we were doing at that point because you know they weren't even in their league at that time and to get one up on them and sign on a Scott Allen, I mean he was okay but if, if Rangers were any after him, I don't think there'd be any interest for Celtic at all. Or there certainly wouldn't be any interest for the media. If he was going to Motherwell or anything or Aberdeen or something like that, I don't think the media would have bothered. But I think they tried to make that a thing more like, oh, so they're going to sign him, so we have to nip them. And I don't know, maybe we just played into that. We got a wee bit caught up in our own vanity and you know, tried to do something that we thought was a wee bit cheeky, wee bit disruptive, you know. Peter Lau wanted to show he's a wee bit one of the boys. He's got a wee bit of a white stick in him. And, uh, no, mm-hmm. and it didn't work out at all. Never played him. Huh? I mean, it's not nah, a bench. He, Forgot Yeah, him. he only got a game here and there sporadically. And, of course, a name that does strike much fear, steve and into Celtic fans when we talk about this grim era, Nadia Chifty, who, keep in mind, when we signed him, had a suspension hanging over him because he bit a player the season before while playing for Dundee United. He was done, he'd done a Luis Suarez, so when we signed him, he couldn't play any domestic games for the first four or five league games, whatever it was. But yep. um, yeah, a bit, bit of a mad signing. But when we talk about, I know Russell said that he would like, he kind of likes the idea of always trying to snap up a player that the is best the best of the, of the rest. rest, right? Yeah. Was Nadia Chifty at that time the best of the rest? In a, in a sense, probably, you know, I, I never thought he was a fantastic player. I never thought he was a, a particularly 
prolific player, or a guy that you looked at and went, we need a, we need a bit of that. I think he's a kind of player, and I, I hate using the term, but same, I'll we'll come back to Scott Allen. On paper, mm-hmm. they made sense. Yep. Um, with the Scott Allen, for example, I think when you look at, you know, after what he'd done when he left us, he always seemed to be a player that could create things. And I think on paper, he was another option that was going to give us service and maybe a wee bit of, you know, skill, a wee bit of flair. And mm-hmm. it just never really panned out for him. The Shifty one is a bit of a weird one because when you look at the fee, it isn't astronomical. Of course it's not. But when you consider the the sort of situation that we were in where there wasn't really that much um, you know, resistance for other teams. Should have we have been paying that for them? Probably not. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because, because like who, you know, you're who you've been held to ransom anytime you're held to ransom is because you've got a really strong hearts or rangers or whatever and it's like we need we need something extra to see these guys off. But there was literally nothing. Do you know what I mean? So I, I think that Nah, I just think it was a bit. It was a bit a strange one. As I say, on paper, he's one of these guys that you'll say he'll be good for the domestic game. Yeah, yeah. But as I say, it needed supplemented with a wee bit more quality, and it just he just never looked apart. He just didn't. I always say when you get guys for these sort of peripheral clubs, it's easy for them to look good in a small team. Mm. And be the one shining light, but when you get put in with a higher quality of players around you, mm. it's sink or swim. Yeah. And more often than not, these sort of experimental buys go the way you'd, you'd expect it to. So, uh, nah, it, I, it, I can't believe how long he actually stayed at us as well I before was... we did get rid of him. <laughs> that's that's, that's the right. most shocking thing, isn't it? The, the only thing I think he's got is a, he's a bit of a pub trivia answer because he's the first player to score under the Brendan Rodgers regime he scored in a friendly Nadia Chifty is the, the first player that scored when Brendan Rodgers was manager, that's the only thing I think chifty has got to his name got a couple of goals this season, totally unmemorable but yeah he's a pub quiz answer with that one if you ever get that one thrown at you uh, who scored the first goal when Brendan Rodgers was Celtic manager, it was Nadia Chifty in a friendly against, I don't even know who they were playing, one of these, I think they went to Slovakia or something for like a training camp, and yeah, that's it, that's, that's, so that's the only thing that Chifty's really got to his name at Celtic, but yeah, he was with us for a few years, because yeah, he, he, he floated about, he floated about as well, didn't he, like, even more recently, he was still on the scene, was he not cutting about trying to steal yeah. a living as a footballer? He was at a Scottish Premier League club not too long ago, I'm sure in the last couple of seasons he was... He's been at Motherwell, hasn't he? He was at Motherwell, has he not? I feel like he was at St. Johnston. Somebody in the chat might come in and tell us, but I've got a vision of him playing for St. Johnston in recent seasons. Um, but yeah, he's still he's Pierre Van Hoydonk was his agent as well. If That's I remember right. right, I know I yep. Pierre. God man, oh, it's all coming back to me now. And in terms of players that did leave though, uh, Adam Matthews was away, Timo Puke, Lucas Zaluska, Amido Baldi, and of course significantly Virgil van Dijk all depart on permanent deals and heading out on loan that summer was Stefan Skepovic there was another great success oh, Darnell Jesus. Fisher Owen O'Connell Ryan Christie rejoined Inverness on loan after we initially signed him so that was the players heading out but for the winter transfer window when it does come out don't worry guys cause it'll, it's going to get better from here because we would sign of course Carlton Cole before that window opened he was a free agent we brought in Colin Kazim Richards Eric Sviachenko and Patrick Roberts on loan oh. Oh, what a season they're really bad Ronnie's getting the, the real uh, vote of confidence there with these signings isn't he Jesus oh. Oh. shocking shocking I mean oh. Kazim Richards where did that come from whose pal was that that we are, it's, that was like Damien oh. Favour. If you take him for six months, you know, before we can shuffle him up, did, did he go to Brazil right after us? He ended up in Brazil, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, it's wow, preferable journeyman. Hmm? Is what? Well, <laughs> preferable journeyman. Yes, as a journeyman. In, insane amount of teams. Mm-hmm. Never get yes. any. No, he, um, um did he. I don't remember him playing for us. I don't remember him actually wearing a strip. Maybe it was one or two he came on as a sub, but he we didn't get much use out of him, did we? He no. did. I was looking it up because he does score like one goal that's quite significant. One. And it's on the day that we wrapped up the title where we beat Hearts at Tynecastle. He scored there. Okay. But there was something as well about on his debut, we played Aberdeen at Pitodry in um, a real lacklustre performance and Aberdeen beat us that night. And he came on and he was lucky not to get sent off because he stamps on a, a player's ankle at one point. And he had a track record 
of being yeah, a hothead. Violent um, guy, yep. But you asked Liam, where did that one come from? Do you remember when we did the Neil Lennon first season a few weeks ago? We did 2010-11. And the uh, right. the trivia question was, can you name all the players that Dudu Dahan has had a, a hand in? Sign said, he's a Dudu Dahan production. I couldn't believe that, that was his agent. But on his website, Scout Push, there was pictures on the Facebook account of him uh, with Colin Kazim Richards in Celtic's uh, trophy room. Uh, they're unveiling, you know, a wee blob above it saying, you know, our right. client Colin Kazim Richards completes his deal. And I was like, that answers that. Where did he come from? Just got on the phone to do do the hand. Look, we, we really need a, another forward on the cheap. Have you got one? There you go. Colin Kazim One of the Richards. worst. I don't know. I, I actually don't know who was worse, Carlton Cole or Kazim Richards. I, I genuinely can't, oh. I can't work it out. It's a, it's, a, it's a toss up. Would you prefer apples or oranges? You know, both uh, absolute bin juice. <laughs> Terrible. I'm bringing it out. My, yeah. my, I never mentioned before my dung hammer and they're <laughs> both getting hit with it because they're absolutely <laughs> red raw. Two of the worst. Like, again, it was went all black and white and grainy, mate. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's so bad. And I guess see the Carlton Cole one, and all the people are obviously talk about Cole and Kazim Mitchell's now. Do you remember that goal that Carlton managed to bundle into the net against Inverness where it actually had his hand on the way in? But that just summed up Carlton Cole. Listen, full time. It, Maeda would have been proud of that. Maeda would have been running away, loving it. <laughs> he would have. <laughs> oh, man. But I, uh, Carlton Cole and Colin Kazim Mitchell's. Jesus fucking Christ, man. Just oh. this season, this so, so, so grim. But let's, let's talk about a positive story before we go into this season. As I said a few minutes ago, Rangers aren't in the league this season because normally what I do in the preseason roundup is I'll go, right, this is what Celtic did. Here's what Rangers did because obviously they would always be our big title competitors, but they're not there. They're nowhere to be seen. Why are they not there? Because they were still in the second tier of Scottish football, having lost a whopping 6 1 to Murrowell in the playoffs the season before. <laughs> Absolute banter years. The peak of well, not even the peak. There was many more peaks to come, William. But at that point in time, that was the peak. It was the most recent event. Balal Mojni, Balal Mojni, <laughs> and Cami <laughs> Bell was the goalkeeper punching into his own net and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh my god, superb, wasn't it, William? I remember finding, I remember finding a way to watch that game. I don't usually go out my way to watch Rangers games, but that <laughs> one, I went out my way to find it and watch it and. Oh my God, right to the closing end yet. They did not disappoint. It was just yeah. like everything that came crashing down could come crashing down. And it's like, you know, we get talked about, like, you know, that, you know, Neil Lennon and Ali McCoy and all that. I mean, Chris, there's a game, shit's kicking off all over the park. They're all going mental, they're flying kung fu kicks at each other, chasing Aye. each other about, and all that. And then that was it. Oh no, he's away. And it, it, there was no talk about that. I mean, you know, we, we throw a nasty look at somebody and we, you know, it's paper news for three, four days, all the talk shows and that. And, was oh, no, was no, that just ignore it. McCall? For Rangers at the time. Was it what? Yes, was it McCall? McCall was a Rangers Aye. manager. Yes, he was. Aye. Aye. That's when he wore the giant suit. Remember he had the giant sort of David Byrne suit for talking heads? It was like 10 yeah. sizes too John's, big for him. a John Cena suit. Too big. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> Do you want to see this? Oh, man. Steve, well, you might remember this. Who was the striker for Morrowell that gets interviewed after the game? The one that got punched by Bilal Mojni? Oh, because oh, the reporter no. asked him, what did you say to him? And he says, the boy with the and sweat back into it. Aye. And he like, I just went up to him and says, good luck next season in the championship. And he's like, he banned you to me. <laughs> That's what he said. I, I, I wish I knew who it was. Somebody I, in the I, chat I might can, know I who it is, him. but I can, I can remember the interview. What did you what did you say to Bill Elmosh to make that give that reaction? Oh, I just said to him, Good luck in the championship next season. And he banned you with me. <laughs> oh. Was it you were saying Louis Moult in the chat? Chris is no, that. I don't Louis think Moult's it was English, I don't think it was Louis Moult. No. Ah, it was no, it wasn't Louis Moult. Definitely the old Glasgow twang his voice, so it's definitely was he not a, it was a boy not a Celtic supporter, if my mind serves me correct, and I think that was could very well have been. Um, right? Part of the wind up as well. <laughs> but, Either uh, way, it was it was absolute eye gravy. Just pour it right in. <laughs> so it's all over. <laughs> oh, it was a phenomenal, phenomenal. We are win, Monty saying. Uh, so that's it. That. Uh, that's the one. Yes, that's yeah. right. Bye. Good that's luck that. in the championship next season, Mister Mosney. Didn't he take it too well to say the least? Because he uh, let him have a good right hook there. Um, but yeah, that's why <laughs> Rangers are not there. So. So their journey, the journey that they talked about, was going to take a wee diversion. 
Uh, they would eventually get the championship at the second time asking and the petrol tank cup at the fourth time asking. Please no laughing at the back. I know you're dying to. But yeah, that's what would happen with them. So the journey that they talk about, it was a wee, a wee bump in the road for them, as it seemed. So uh, it came mm-hmm. in Motherwell. Now, of course, with that free hit that we've got, so we can concentrate fully on the Champions League. That's us. We're all tooled up now. We're ready to go with signings like Saidi Yanko and Nadia Chifty. How did we actually do it in said European qualifiers? Well, the answer to that is fucking shite. Absolutely no. rotten. Uh, we beat Icelandic side Standing uh, quite comfortably. I believe it was like 6-1 on aggregate. We then limped past uh, Azerbaijan powerhouse Karabag. Not to be mistaken with carrier bag, but yeah, we uh, beat them 1-0 at Celtic Park. Boyata scored, and then we drew 0-0 in Baku, a nervy night out there, but we snuck through to the next round up against Malmo from uh, Sweden. And a certain Joe Inger Berget would be in that team, yep. Liam, and he would come back and haunt us because he would score two goals that night to uh, make it a 3-2 victory for Celtic on the night, but away goals was still very mm-hmm. much in play, but you just kind of knew it was going to happen. I think this is the first time I can remember having doubts over Lustig, because Lustig was getting on in his 30s at that point, and there's a couple of goals this season he loses where it's across to the back post, and he's tucked in too deep. He's came into the sort of centre-back positions, and there's a player behind him that he's completely forgot about, and in this case, it was Joanne Gerberget, but this one takes it down and volleys into the net. Oh, After it's a, good, it's a cracking goal, by the way. It's a cracking goal. goal. Aye. Aye. But if you remember as well, goal. we were 2 0 up after 10 minutes in that game. So you thought, oh, this, this is going to be something special tonight. You know, we're going to absolutely rattle them because it was Griffiths and Beaton scored for us. But yeah, then uh, Joanne Gerber get happened. And uh, yeah, it was a, was a nervy one in the end. But did you have a sinking feeling or did you still think after it? No, we can still go out there yeah. and we can go do this. Oh, I mean, for Carabag on, you've always got that sinking feeling as well. They're never ever comfortable watching a Ronnie Deli aside in Europe. You know, it's even two nothing up. We, it showed us, proved us. You know, we guys like Effie out there that were just dying to like just throw a spanner into the mix. You know, culture of chaos just kicking off back there, and you never knew when it was going to erupt. That was the one thing that this team. I mean. The entire team, they were brilliant going forward and they could be explosive, but it could also be explosively bad. They could go in both uh, ways. They were either like throwing everything at other teams and just completely drowning them out with goals or we just lose the plot. And it was like we forgot how to play football. You know, guys like Swedish internationalists not popping back and making normal tracking runs. I don't know that. I think that was the discipline in the team. We really, really lacked focus and discipline and it really, really showed up in Europe. And maybe something I want to talk about later, and we've talked about all this season so far, our captain was Scott Brown that year, and he'll, we'll talk about him later as well when it comes to diet and things like that, but mm. I expected a bit more from the captain that year to sort of mm. control the things that were going on the pitch. When we were exploding, we needed a voice out there, a mature voice, somebody that could calm everybody down and go, right, you know, Lustig, you know better than that. You know, whatever it is mm-hmm. that you have to say and how you grabbed it and it together, didn't harm, no, did it? I mean, it was always... Oh. It didn't matter how much we are up, you were never comfortable. No. Aye. If I, I remember I think, right, I, did we lose both goals that night, Steve? Oh, corners as well. It was like two identical goals. One of them's definitely a corner. Like a guy gets a flick on at the near post. There's set, there's, aye, there's set pieces involved. I, I think, you know, it's interesting what Liam said there. And he took the words right out of my mouth. See, when you actually look back on the, the sort of dial era, particularly with, like, with John Collins and all you everybody jokes, the passing, the movement, the tempo, the right? Post. There was genuinely none of it. Like, mm-hmm. like, we just looked like a team who I couldn't tell you, they did no football identity, there was no real yeah. sort of one thing that they'd done. I think it, it, there was, in principle, there was ideas in his head about what he thought mm. and a philosophy that we should have been doing, but it never really translated on the pitch. It just looked like, we've got better players than you and we will win. Yeah, And that's fine and you can muck through because in the league, it literally is, you only need better players, let's be totally honest here. But as he says, it comes undone when you go, and you play like, oh, a Malmo in a great shakes, yep. organised in their game plan, and it, we just get picked apart at the seams. Yep. And I, I think that's a, you know, that's a big thing that you know he mentioned there, and, and it rings through it the whole way through Ronnie's season. You know, we were 
losing games or drawing games to, to teams that like, what's going on here? Yeah. And it was just because we didn't have an identity. It was right. literally like, right, just go and win the game, boys. Mm. I mean, it's obviously that wasn't what's happening, but that's just how it felt. It just felt void of all these ideas. And even you look at, um, you know, John Collins, his Hibs team, they had an identity, but none yeah. of that came through. It's very strange. I can remember after the defeat in Malmo, one player in particular that copped a lot of flack was Stuart Armstrong, who was played as like a sort of left winger that night. Because yep. Ronnie, much like his who would follow on from Brendan, <laughs> loved the good old 4 2 3 1. You know, two centre defensive bids, three attacking bids, and then you've got the one striker. And he decided to play Armstrong as either on the left side of attacking mid or the right side of attacking mid rather than a sort of box to box through the middle guy. And he was. I remember that night after the social media reaction, that actually was the, the sort of catastrophic meltdown that you get when Celtic have a bad result on social media. But I can remember Armstrong in particular um, getting a lot of flack for his performance. And then that season, compared to the half season him and Mackay Stephen had had when they initially joined, where they yep. were excellent, this whole season coming up, the two of them just looked like you could easily just got rid of them at the end of the, the coming or the season that we're about to talk about, and no doubt bad an eyelid. Okay, Mackay Stephen obviously didn't quite amount to much at Celtic, but Armstrong no. we would have missed out on a hell of a player, but he was completely lost this coming season as well. But I can remember him getting a lot of flack that night, and it was the I was really so it was one of the yellow and black kits we had, the neon yellow and black. It was the bumblebee. One, but I remember the colour. Yeah. It was the bright neon yellow and black. Yep, that's right, yes. That stands out for this season and all. But I that night in Malmo, just the visions in my head. This is Virgil van Dyke's. Basically, this is the game that he decided after that. It's like Wamowski. I think he plays against St. Johnston at the weekend, and then that's it. He's away at that point. But uh, yeah, we were never holding on to him. Once really, and once that Champions League was gone, it was like Van Dyke. I'm, pff, I'm out of here. Ironically, he goes to a team that's nowhere near even playing in Europe down in England, but hey, such is the draw of an English Premier League team, wasn't it? I mean, he went in there with him and smashed it still anyway, but, Aye. you know, you know, expectations if he's leaving us. Everybody knew he should be playing at a higher level than Southampton. It was only a matter of time, but, guys, it's an inconvenience, you know? It's like, that 80 mil could have came to us, you know, rather than going down and just mm. proving yourself to Southampton. This game against Malmo... Was it no Moldy? Was it Moldy or Malmo? Sorry, we play Moldy coming Malmo? up, and uh, it's Malmo in the qualifier. Right. Swedish they die. I remember their uh, their left back. Who was it? Mellenberg uh, played with him. He was a cracky player. I remember us being yeah. linked. We were linked yeah. with him around about that time as well. And mm. I always thought yeah, he would have been right. absolutely brilliant player, but we would have never seen Tierney if we'd go to him. You know, that's true. I yeah. I was sliding doors yeah, moment there. Has he yeah, popped up again not too long ago? Hmm? He's been mentioned yeah. a few times, aye. He's been mentioned a few times. Aye, there's Monty saying Melberg, aye. Melberg, aye. Guy. So. Guy was a good, good player. And I remember he killed us that night. He just seemed to be running everything, you know, and taking control and all that. That's what I said about what Steve was saying, but having a strong identity. You yes. could see that they had that they had the belief system in them that was mm. just completely at odds with mm. ours. We still had that shaky, you know, you know, we're somewhere, somehow we're going to find a way to lose us. And that's just mm. what summed up that season, even though we were winning most of our games, but in Europe, I mean, oh, we didn't yeah. even do too bad, but we just turned off for like 15 minutes here and there. That's what nice. was wrong with that team. Was, there wasn't a focus. Yep. Such a trope of Celtic in Europe. It's always like we always can see goals really, really quickly, you know, like back to back, very close together because we just switch off for a period. And yeah, it's, it's very, very yeah. typical. See, the two goals in Malmo, I'm sure, are identical goals and they all are pretty close to each other as well. It's just like, oh, it's just damage limitation after that. But yeah, off we were out of the Champions League. And also, you may remember this just a wee fact about the friendlies we played that summer. We played games at St. Midden's ground rather than Celtic Park. Because Celtic Park was getting relayed, apparently. I had to look this up. So I remember we played there, but I never actually knew the reason why. But the CelticWiki.com has actually got the reason. Celtic Park was getting relayed and they cut a deal with St. Mirren to play friendlies out of... Um, well, I, I still call it Love Street because I still don't know what St. Yeah. Mirren's actual official stadium name is. So I just call it Love Street all the time. But yeah, we uh, played some friendlies out of there. It's like Dukla Prague. There's a there's a name of Blast for the Past. We played uh, Den Bosch oh. from Holland and Real Sociedad. 
Uh, but yeah, we agreed to cut a deal with St. Mirren on that one. So yeah, the, other than that though, we've covered everything we need to now in the pre-season roundup. We've just passed the hour mark, so perfect time in there. So I'll put the musical interlude in there and we will come back in a couple of minutes where we will now get into the 2015-16 season. We'll see you in a couple of moments, folks. I mean, you've all that stuff at the start. You know, they won't be playing Tina Turner on the coach on the way home, will they? Uh, some of his comments about me deliberately trying to, to cause contra controversy. Well, I'm like in the media now. And you've got someone sitting there next to you who's an embarrassment to the media profession. He's an apologist. He's a charlatan. He's a Rangers puppet. He's a cheerleader. That's what he is. And we are back, folks. So, 2015-16 season. Let's see what we can talk about. Yes. Cheers to you, <laughs> Charlie. Nice one. What are you drinking, anyway? Corona. Ah, <laughs> Corona. So, a topical <laughs> word over the last few years. <laughs> what about you, Steve? What are you? What are you drinking? Got a wee combination. I've got a Williams Brothers Shake Guava. Lad, radical Lager, and I've oh, got a wow. uh, wee Desperados in there. So a wee, a wee, bit, of, wee bit of flavour in my life. Oh, mixing it up a wee bit. A wee, uh, mix Hold up on, wait a minute, wait a minute. What sort of lager was it? What? It's called Shea Guava. Aye. It's by Williams it's Brothers. They make like, yeah, so they make like, they make like IPAs and the likes, um, but it's sort of guava infused lager. It's lovely. Oh, okay. Yeah, check But yeah, 2015 16 season, guys, in terms of talking points, I think this is a good one to start with because every so often we do these, we we'll always get to a point where we need to dedicate a whole segment to one player in particular. And this season did uh, produce something that we, I don't think anybody saw coming because in mm. January of 2015, the previous season, there's a certain Australian midfielder who returned from a loan spell completely under the radar. Nobody really batted an eyelid at it. As we say a lot on the show, nobody cares, mate. Tom Rogic came back from his loan. The last time he'd actually started a game for Celtic was the ill-fated Greenock Morton game in September 2013 in the League Cup. That was the last time he'd started. He had a few sub-appearances. Then in January 2014, he went back to Australia on a loan spell. Came back in January 2015. Didn't get a look in for the rest of Ronnie's first season. But in the summer, during those pre-season friendlies at St. Mirren, he began getting a few runouts, and you're like, maybe maybe you'll get a chance here. But Liam, if um, anybody had said to you in that summer there, before this season started, or Tom Rogic has left, went with a permanent deal, you wouldn't have batted an eyelid at it, would you? Honestly, do you even know where he went? Where was he on I, one? 
I believe he went back to Australia on loan, but I don't know which club it was right. with. But somebody in the chat will correct us if that's the case. But I generally don't know. I just thought he went back there to sort of, I don't know, improve his game, I guess. Maybe he just wasn't ready. But yeah, oh if he'd left in the summer of 2015, I don't think he would have even no. cared, would you, Liam? I would have been not yeah. bothered. I mean, okay. Well, he'd be there with like Nedar Sifti or people like that that we talk about that maybe had loads of potential but never really showed up mm-hmm. for us in the hoops. Yeah. You know, when he came back in, it was like, ah, okay, well, he's back. You know, I always had high hopes. I remember listening to a podcast and they were interviewing some uh, Australian coaches. I think it was an ex-Rangers player as well. And they were talking about, like, what a player this boy and how he used to play. Was it, you call it foosball or something, where you, it's like the heavier ball and you play in the gymnasium. And then he was really Ah, good at that. Yeah, 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 foosball, yeah. You know, and, and they were talking about it, like, oh, this guy's an absolutely brilliant player. And so I had high hopes for him. And then he just sort of watched and, you know, just slowly go away till he was out on loan. And then when he came back, yeah, honestly, I really forgot we had him at that point, you know. Mm-hmm. I didn't think, Aye. and especially by Scott Allen as well. You think Scott Allen would have got a game before Rogic? Aye. Yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. That's basically, you know, you get that expression, you know, it's like a new signing, a player that's suddenly galvanized. In the end, what, what would happen with Tom Rogic would be like that. He was like a new signing with the, the new lease of life that he had under Ronnie. Um, but yeah, what was your initial sort of like, were you the same as like us, but it was just like, it kills me. Like Tom Rogic totally forgot he was even on our books. It, it was one of these guys that when initially signed, you were you were intrigued, you were a bit interested, you heard all the sort of background about the futsal type thing. He wasn't a professional footballer per se, he was kind of adapting. So he all sounded rather exotic and rather exciting. And then he never really got much time. And as you say, when he came back, it was almost just like, oh, all right, he's back, cool, whatever. <laughs> so, and, and he literally could have just disappeared out the door and nobody would have known anything or probably bothered. But as you say, he's obviously started to get to the stage where he got, you know, he's starting to get chances. You know, we'll go in there. Never, and this season for me at least, never, never were like, awestruck when we thought he was going to end up having the career that he did have, but it was better than getting nothing out of him, wasn't it? It was. It was, yeah. man. He was, um, he would surprise a lot of us here, but yeah, early on he showed, uh, you know, of what was to come, because he didn't, um, on the, the opening game against Ross County, um, he was on the bench, the opening league game, uh, but uh, didn't make, didn't get on the park at all, but in the second game, we went to Partick Thistle to play, and only well, early in the first half, he actually got a goal, if you remember, Liam. It was McGregor cut down the left-hand side, puts a low cross in, and Griffiths, I don't know if Griffiths sort of miscontrols it, but it kind of works at one of those, if he's meant it, it's really, really smart the way he's laid it off to him. But he sort of tries to control it and turn and ends up just laying it right into the path of Rogic, who's in the right place at the right time, that sort of ghosting into the box that he would do. We'd see it many, many times over his, uh, his career at Celtic. But yeah, he was off and running, so right away you're like, oh, didn't you, didn't you see that coming at all? You know, you've got to be unexpected surprised. Tom Rogic getting a goal just a matter <clears> of a games into the season. Uh, it says it's, it's that like that news. He does feel like a new signing because up to that point, I mean, I can't even remember. He did get a couple of games under Lenny like early on, but if he did even score a goal, I genuinely can't remember it. But I, this is the first thing I can remember Tom Rogic doing in a Celtic shot was uh, that goal at Far Hill, but. Ah, a, a, a decent start. If you want to endear yourself to the fan base, that's the perfect way to do it, Liam. Get off to a, get off to a good start. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, I won't want to say first impressions because it's not really a first impression, but it's like a, he's got a second chance essentially. And what a way to take it! Well, it's good. I mean, I think when he went on loan, like we talked about when we remember when we did the loan special, and we talked yeah. about Callum McGregor coming back really good, and Ryan Christie and all that. That loan, that loan really helped him out. I mean, what it is, I think, I think he was trying to compete with pace and all that and things, and he just didn't have that. And mm-hmm. I think what happened was in a way when he when he came back, he had a better awareness of the space around him and the speed he was required to get into that space. So we always looked deceptively slow, but as you say, yeah. out of nowhere, he's ghost is ghosting into that open space and all that. Yep. And that's what I thought was different about his game. That also gave him a bit more time on the ball as well. And what I always amazed about Roger was when he came back, I couldn't believe, like, everybody became really aware, or as Russ would say, acutely aware, of how mm-hmm. well Roger could handle the ball in small spaces. 
Like, yeah. and it's like, how is he not getting one? Is how is he not getting booted to fuck? You know, how is he still standing? And the other is like, he's just his feet were so quick, and he's a yeah. deceptively big guy as well. And so I think when oh, he came back yeah. to that one, he had tuned up his game something, and so whatever whatever happened for him down there, I think was positive, and and it was great to watch it evolve over the season. It was, it definitely was. And Steve, when we talked about the James Forrest show that we did a couple of weeks ago, we, we got to Ronnie era James Forrest. We talked about the buy in to Ronnie's yeah. sort of like philosophy and how James Forrest, like he physically changed at that point, bulked up. Tom Rogic and a Ronnie Dyla team is a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? It shouldn't really work because one of the things that he wasn't great with and still right up till leaving Celtic was his fitness. But, yeah. you know, Ronnie was all about fitness, you know, and stuff like that. But for the times that Ronnie could get him on the park, he seemed to really get a tune out of him because everyone always associates Rogic with Brendan's first season and obviously the goal he would mm-hmm. go on and score in the cup final and some of the moments he had that season. Unbelievable. But obviously this is his launching pad. But yeah, it doesn't seem to compute when you think of what Ronnie Dyla was all about and Tom Rogic's fitness issues it seemed over his career. It shouldn't really have worked, but it somehow did. No, you're right, and uh, you know, uh, talking about the whole idea is a, a new sign and whatnot. I think come back to what I said earlier about Celtic didn't really have this identity that mm. was you know tangible and visible, and you could see it, and you could work it was happening. So getting somebody, you know, Russell always used the term a, a rogue or a, mm. a joker in the park. See, getting somebody like him that is just he's got magic in his feet, and he can just yeah. decide to. To, to do so, and I'm going to just try this, and and it'll come off more often than not. That helped us by not having that identity. So when you had this guy that you could just give the ball to, and something would happen, maybe out of nowhere. I think that's maybe where it gave him a wee bit of a shoehorn in the team, not because he fitted some system as such, yeah. but just because he was able to do stuff that those around him, when they were going through the motions, couldn't do. And in terms of the, the fitnesses, we'll go into it at some stage. For all that Dyla was a big advocate of fitness and you obviously had John Collins and the likes there, his application of it was ironically severely flawed and mm. was com- none of the, the, the fitness and nutrition was really conducive to a sport such as football. Mm. Um, so it, it kind of in a weird way, it didn't really matter that he wasn't overly fit because Aye. when you look at it on the balance, none of the team really were that fit. Aye, it seemed to for, for for what was getting projected. So I, you know, it kind of it kind of was a perfect aligning of the stars from. I think it was. Oh, it all worked out from very well because yeah, by the end of the 20, 2015, you know, halfway through the season, he would have notched up uh, five league goals and one goal in the cup. The one goal in the cup in particular was an absolute screamer, which we would become accustomed to with Tom Rogish over the years. He didn't, we quickly learned that he didn't always score tap-ins. That wasn't his favourite type of goal. But he scores two amazing goals at Tynecastle, one in the league and one in a cup game, a league cup match. Uh, outside of the box, left foot, bends it into the top corner. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's a, a move that we would become very, very used to, but he did it twice at Tynecastle. The league, the one in the league that we drew two each just about the turn of the year is an absolute rasp. It actually pings off the crossbar as well on the way in. But yeah, I can remember the one in the League Cup as well where it just like, lays off to him nicely in the edge of the air and he just bends into the top corner. We end up winning 2-1 and knocking hearts out. But yeah, it would become obviously a, a trademark as over the next few years. But then I think he saved in the second half of the season we saw the opposite end of the spectrum um, where he had a, a moment he'll be infamously remembered for and a moment that he'll be celebrated for. So you saw, you saw both ends of it, Liam, because obviously in the run-in of the title race, and there was incredibly a title race still on at this point in March because we were kind of limping along. Aberdeen were a point behind us that day, although we had a game in hand. We went to Kilmarnock in the early kickoff that day and uh, the game at 0-0, 89th minute, not looking like we're going to score. A very stuffy command like defence. Couldn't they break them down? Finding ourselves in a position, if we don't win this and Aberdeen win the day, they're going to go top of the league. That's unforgivable at this stage of the season. But then a pass inside to Callum McGregor and one sort of motion, he turns on the ball, gets on his left foot and from 30 yards, Liam, Tom Rogic mm. absolutely unleashes it and it bends right in the top corner. It's one of the best goals he scored, obviously, from the, the season that he really broke through. He's good scoring, scored a lot of amazing goals. But I think when you ask people your favourite Tom Rogic goal, 
this one is definitely up there for many. See, when I was young, I used to draw pictures of me scoring goals in my in my notebooks and all that. And that was always a type of goal. It was always one of the Roy of the Rovers where you see the whoosh lines curling into the corner of the net. Mm. So, Roger, you could score those. You feel like you oh, can God. see the lines. That was Roy of the Rovers type stuff. That was like that was comic book goals, you know. And he was he was oh. good at doing that. And I think his balance, his technique. Everything about him was just sound, you know. We always just said if only we could get a full 90 minutes out of him. You know, and that was oh, always God, the thing. There was never a question of his talent. And mm -hmm. you know, they were exceptional goals, Phil. You know. Aye. It was a good thing he was on the park there in the 89th minute. I can't remember if he even started that game or he came on as a sub, but it was a good thing he was on the park at that one time because we needed that goal that day. And Steve, I assume your memories of that one are the same because it's an absolute yeah. rasper, isn't it? It's the cleanest of strikes. And again, some oh. I've said previously on Bastalgia, that green pinstripe top, I always oh, associate seasons with the visual. Yep. The shot's one of the first things that come out. And again, it's, it's, it's not too dissimilar in the way that he picks the ball up to the goal that he scores and then he stands on, baits his foot. Obviously, he's <laughs> not off balance, but not that way. He, he looks, a way I would describe him, a wee gazelle, he's lighting his feet. He gets the ball and he just takes a wee skip and then he it's possibly the cleanest strike you'll get. Mm. Just poof, straight in and I what a goal, you know, as he says, it's definitely Toppy's um highlight reels. Oh, um it's... obviously the, 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 the cup final he gets the invincible trebles going, he always be the one that everybody remembers in the celebration, yeah. but that's got to be right up there. And she oh, says I don't, it's strangely significant. Who would have thought oh. that it would have been that and that and tuck at that stage? But there you I go. Know. I know, mental. But yeah, that gave us a wee four-point gap that day. It turned out Aberdeen would actually lose later that day in Murrowell. So it gave us a wee four-point cushion with a game in hand. So it gave us a wee bit of breathing room. But yeah, at that stage, middle of March, it was getting a little bit uncomfortable. I said, unfortunately, though, we did get the old, both ends of the spectrum with Tom Rogic in the second half of that season because we went for that goal. He would have quite an infamous moment, which we will go on to later because we were going to talk about that game unfortunately that semi-final mm. but uh yeah before we um move on from tom rogic yeah, i'll just for the two years what is your favorite tom rogic moment or goal then uh, over his time at celtic <clears throat> aberdeen. aberdeen aberdeen final Cup final, Cup final. Nice. it was an unbelievable goal yes unbelievable the way he celebrated it in the crowd uh you could see he that was a that was a all coming together and that one i bet you that's his best moment ever in celtic well, and what a moment to remember. You know, oh, just jump diving in the crowd after a goal like that. Oh, yeah. uh, the lightning bolt that went across the sky as well just before he struck it. That's uh, oh, yeah. People say it's an urban legend, but it's not. I, I was yeah, in the stadium and I saw it. I saw the lightning bolt because it distracted me for a split second before he scored the goal because I looked at the lightning bolt and then when I looked back down again, the ball was in the back of the net because I was sitting in the south stand looking towards where the Asda would be at Tory Glen because that's where it came from, the lightning bolt. So I glanced to that end, and then uh, when I looked back down briefly, the ball was hitting the back of the net. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> this carnage just broke out. But the scenes for that moment are just incredible. The the Craig Gordon moment where he stood on his knees and all the fans in the background. It's just carnage. Fucking brilliant, man. What a moment. Um, Steve, is that with you as well? Is that your favourite moment in goal? So... I'd have to say I'd have to say yes, but also at the same time I need to caveat that by saying I didn't see it. I was actually the displeasure of being at my work that day, mm. and I was listening to it on the radio of all things. So you can imagine oh. how fucking brutal that was. <laughs> um, but I remember as the goal went in, and I was the most unsufferable person in the world to some of my colleagues that. Uh, didn't support Celtic and was banging on walls and banging on tables and going mental and, uh, and unsufferable. So I didn't see it. So in terms of everything that goes with the imagery and the rain and all that stuff, and stuff, of course it is. Do you know what I mean? Of course it is. But if I was to pick one I saw, it would be the goal, as I say, where he, he scores against Rangers and he stands on baits on the way down. And it sounds really, really stupid, but apart from it being an absolute topper of a goal, and that sounds really geeky. I love goals that I love the visuals. I say that visual and sound are a big thing for me. See when it hits the net, I love that clog. Just hear it hitting the net. Aye. And that 
that it just it makes the mm-hmm. goal just look so much better you hear yep. that and it sounds really daft it's a wee sort of quirky thing that i've got but uh, the, the, the Carlo McGregor in, goal from the season before against Rangers at Hamden, and then it the makes net. the noise when it hits yep. the net because and that's just that. I so that that in terms of one that I saw is my favourite goal, and then obviously we get to laugh because like oh he found his way. They're the hero getting taken off. He's got himself. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> uh, he was the best thing since sliced bread. I'm pretty sure he was the next day. Uh, All of the players. He was the next are. Terry Butcher, was he not? Um, but, so cool. Aye, so as I say, it's not in terms of significance, obviously the cup final, but in terms of ones that I actually saw hmm. the win there. Yep. I love the the game under Brendan where we were 2 0 down at Murrow and came back to win 4 3, and Rogic scored in the last minute. To win it, that was a fucking brilliant moment as well because the, the invincible travel wouldn't it be an invincible season had we lost that game? All it takes is one loss, yep. and then mm-hmm. you go, Well, it's a, it was still a treble, but then it's like it's not got that invincible tag there. But yeah, that that was some day that one. Uh, but what a finish that was his right foot as well. But I uh, would have a lot of great moments. But this season is the launching pad for him under Ronnie, even though most fans always think of the first <coughs> season under Brendan where he really came into his own. But no, he had a lot of good moments during this season as well. And that goal against Kilmarnock was absolutely phenomenal. Now, another player that would absolutely flourish this season and again might feel like a bit of an oxymoron under Ronnie because again, fitness and so forth. But <laughs> We've got to talk about Foygal striker because this is that season that Lee Griffiths would score 40 goals in all competitions. The one that would be with him forever more where years down the line, fans, there would still be a collection of fans that would still say, best finisher at the club, get him fit, 40 goals a season, no problem. The, this, this would just follow him wherever he went. But... To his credit, regardless of what competition he was up against in the league and so forth, you still got to be in the right place at the right time you put them in the net. And 40 goals in one season is the first time any Celtic player had done it since Henrik Larsson in 2004. So it was quite a, quite a gap between uh, the last time somebody had done it. But yeah, Lee Griffiths came on leaps and bounds. And if you remember, when we did the 2014-15 show, we talked about that season, we brought in Skepovic and Gadetti had started the season really well and Griffiths had to bide his time. And once it was obvious that Skepovic wasn't going to make it and Gadetti had his little salt and decided he wasn't going to stay, Griffiths came in and basically was like, well, nobody's taking this place off of me now. Ended up finishing the season with like 20 goals or whatever it was. And then this season, again, going back to what I said, they were a bit shifty. I just remember this, but see the European games we played during the, the summer that season? Chifty started those. I don't know if it's just a case of, right, he's not available for the domestic games, we're going to use him in this, or were they genuinely thinking Chifty's going to be our guy? We're going to, Chifty's the guy we're going to go with. But obviously, he couldn't play in the domestic games for the first four or five. So mm-hmm. Griffiths had to start. And again, Griffiths was like, you're not taking this place off of me. And he would just go from strength to strength in this season. Um, he was, again, it goes without saying, Easily the best season you'd ever had for us, Liam, regardless of what our feelings are towards him now and all that. We're talking about at this point in time, there was no striker hotter than Lee Griffiths in the 2015-16 season. See, I think the team having a real lack of identity, that benefited Griffiths in this season. Mm. You know, I think, I think, my opinion, I think Griffiths is a very much an, an ego-driven player. You know, he, he, he loves the limelight, you know, he gets in all sorts of trouble, we all know that. You know, but he likes being, at some point, he was looking for a platform. And I think because we had so many individuals on the team, him being a more individual and being in a role that's more selfish as a striker, I think that was allowed to flourish in that environment. You know, you had all the chaos around it as well, too, that which he could very much have been a part of. Well, we know he was, you know, but as well in that environment. All right, <coughs> who, else, who else he was up again? And I think... Just grabbed that moment. He bullied his way, way into being the top striker, you know, and and I think that was good for him at that point. You know, it shows you, but but what he was trying to do, but I think is a lot different, you know, than than you know, like a, being a really good team player and stuff like that. I think that's maybe why he mm-hmm. fell apart with with Rogers a bit, is because then yeah. it became more of a team focus game, where if it was just all about Lee and leave it to Lee, forty goals. Oh. 
Uh, he mm-hmm. was he was exceptional that season. Although uh, <laughs> I do laugh at going from Chris saying forty goals. Thought that was when he ended up with forty wins. Yeah, he was. He went does have a <laughs> reputation with stuff like that. And also to other Chris in the chat, I believe it's thirty one league goals he got, but it was forty in all competitions. He was the first player since say Larson to hit forty in all competitions in a season since two thousand and four. In fact, it was up at Tanadice as well. There was a moment where he scored his fiftieth goal for the club. He scored a brace up there, and uh, he had the 50 shot under his um, his Celtic shot. He scored there, but yeah. yes, Devo, he was on Red Top Forum, and quite an amazing start as well. As During that season, Scotland had seven games. They had uh, four qualifying games for Euro 2016, and uh, three for injuries, and he only played, he only started one and had a substitute appearance in the other. On uh, three of the games, he didn't even get called up, and I'd say he's easily the hottest Scottish striker at that point. Not distracting, just didn't he really fancy him at all, did he? No, I think that, see, we actually come back to a bit what Liam said as well. You can't take away 40 goals as a, as a record. It's there, it's, you know, it's set in history now, and, you know, it was a great achievement. Um, but you've also got to be objective, haven't you? You've got, listen, you've got to be objective. And if we're being totally honest, the general standard across the league at that time wasn't great. Right? No, no. Which is why he never replicated it any other time. Yeah, he's given chances, right? And I think maybe Strachan not fancying him plays a wee bit into that knowledge. Of, well, it's just it, the league is a bit turgid at the moment. It's not. It's not overly impressive. And there's not. Listen, there's always going to be that argument if somebody's on form, we give him a chance, irrespective of what league they're playing in or whatever. Do you know what I mean? So if there's a guy who's going for the goals in the championship. You'd be shouting to give him a chance, wouldn't you? Look at mm. Warren Shankland, for example. Warren Shankland, aye. Right, so there's a prime example, but sometimes it just never pans out that way. But I totally agree with what Liam says. For me, Griffiths isn't great at playing the system. Yeah. He's very much he's very much like uh, Derek Riordan, for example, mm-hmm. yeah. who is individually fantastic if you just leave him to his own devices, but is pretty horrendous at screwing the nut and playing yeah. a system we were just fortunate we didn't have a system you know what I mean so he was happy to pick the ball up and lash it in for like 25-30 mm. yeah. yards out or, or happen to be in there at the right place at the right time put one away whereas if you look at Griffiths in say for example a comedy system where he has mm. to really knuckle down and discipline it, it probably doesn't work yeah true you know, so that, and even look at whenever he gets chances under Rodgers, a lot of the goals he scored was him just grabbing it and deciding to do it. Hi, just put his legs <laughs> you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so it's probably no surprise that he scored so many, a combination between the standard and where the league was at the time, and as we say, no identity, no real playing style. Mm. So it was literally just shoot on sight if you've got the opportunity. And he had magic in his feet. He was undoubtedly one of the best natural strikers that we've yep. had at the club for a long period of time. And that whole madness of how unhinged and you know unorganised, if you will, the team was, I think probably really helped him out. Aye, it did. Yeah. See, the, the, those two seasons under Ronnie, there were points where he did seem to be like, no first choice, but when he got his chance, he just made sure, no, I'm, I'm keeping this shot. And he would just... Uh, same so point, he did help that he just would lash the ball into the next. He had a hell of a left foot yeah. on him, and there's no doubt about it. You can't take I mean, it away. He was a decent striker. And if you look at the other options about him, I mean, Chifty was garbage. Yep. Callum Cole with disgust. Skepovich, <laughs> Kazim Richards. I mean, seriously. <laughs> so, yeah. So, Aye. yeah. No, nah, he came on always fine. But yeah, it obviously didn't work out for Griffiths in the end. And we've, we could we could be here all night talking about the, the pros and cons of Lee Griffiths and whatnot. But obviously his career at Celtic came to an end a couple of years ago and that's that really. But, you know, there was that period in time where he did notch 40 goals in one season and it was a massive contributor to his winning the title that season. No he was playing Australia and fighting with old men at the side of the pitch. <laughs> I know, crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, before we quickly move on as well, Mon, he's asked to highlight this. I'd actually this on the news earlier today, the work that Lou McCarry's doing down in Stoke for, to help homeless people and so on. It was featured on the BBC News this morning as I was working from home and had it on in the background of BBC Breakfast. Uh, it was highlighted, the Luigi McCarry have got an actual whole um, segment on it. So I, it's definitely worth checking out on YouTube as well. It's a phenomenal cause and phenomenal work that he's doing down there. 
because uh, you know it's um the other club you know Celtic in particular you know it's all about you know helping charity and stuff like that and it's good to see that Macari continues that legacy with the work that he's doing even though it may not be in Glasgow but yeah down in Stoke just now he's obviously set up a scheme to help homeless people so definitely go and check it out yeah. see I've saw this morning as I was doing my work and uh eating another another macaroni pie for my breakfast cornerstone of any nutritious breakfast <laughs> <laughs> Com guys, be sure to check it out. Now, let's get on to the controversy. We've celebrated Rogic how he did that season. Griffiths obviously has contributions, but let's go on to the, the real big talking point of this season. Because again, the domestic stuff kind of take care of itself. It was all about European football. We blew it obviously in the qualifiers for the Champions League. We're gonna have to make do with the Europa League. We're gonna have to make do with that, but it's still a decent enough level. But we'd end up drawing Ajax, Fenerbahce and Molder from Norway, who Ronnie would surely be a bit familiar with, given, you know, Norwegian club, being a Norwegian himself. But, of course, the whole campaign is famous for something that did happen in Norway and Molder, the meltdown in Molder. But before we get to that, quick recap of what happened. We actually started not too bad. We had credible, I would say, 2-2 draw in Amsterdam against Ajax. Dear Beaton gave us the lead. Ajax got an equaliser and then we killed Wustig, put his 2-1 up. But in the second half, it was a back-to-the-wall performance where Ajax had his pinned in. Also, Emilio Ezeguiri was just, I don't know what he was on that day, but he was throwing himself into tackles. And it's like, he's going to get sent off. And lo and behold, Emilio Ezeguiri got himself sent off midway through the half, which didn't make it any easier for us. But the 10 men, about five minutes to go, uh, Ajax would get an equaliser from a free kick out wide. It was whipped in at ferocious pace. Craig Gordon didn't know how to deal with it. Beat him at his, I think, his uh, far post. But yeah, 2-2 draw, though, in the grand scheme of things. Celtic to go away from home in Europe to Amsterdam and get a draw. It's no bad. Sets us up nicely for the next game against Fenerbahce at Celtic Park. Now, an interesting note, though, a little uh, sort of like side note to this one, Liam, is the red card to Emilio Izaguiri would present an opportunity for one Kieran Tierney. We talked about guys like Griffiths coming in and taking their chance and Rogic taking their chance. Here's another one as well, because as a gear gets sent off, couldn't play the next European game. And that night, Kieran Tierney started against Fenerbahce and the lad did not look out of place and what, what, well, look what he went on to do at Celtic. But this was the beginning of Kieran Tierney. I know he'd made his debut the season before in a dead rubber game at the end of the season. But yeah, this game coming in, European night, Fenerbahce at home, decent opposition. He was bloody good that night. I know. Every, all of us on this bus, at some point, we're probably old enough to look around the pub and just go, player. Right away, you could just tell. you just seen guys looking at each other and going, where did this boy come from? And it's like, oh, he just brought him up. All right. He looked mm -hmm. solid. He didn't look, always thought anytime we brought anybody up, they always thought, like, he'll be good when he puts on a bit of muscle. Or a bit of you know like physicality. Tierney, you know, although he was young and still looked built like a young boy, he looked physical and he was certainly up for a challenge. And he also mm -hmm. he did that wee bit of what we talked about about Craig Bellamy. A wee bit of punk rock about him. A wee bit about mm -hmm. something about him. There was an edge to Tierney that was cultivated within his, you know, like being part of his Celtic support. So you could just see that he was energizing. He was just vibrating off the noise of the crowd as well. Like, you know, you see some people who are terrified, and then you see these mm -hmm. other guys that are just electrified. There was a buzz yep. about them. That's what he looked mm -hmm. like that day. And you could tell as well. It's like, all right, okay. That was a good thing that came out of it. You know? That was. I, I can remember being at the game that night, and there was a few. This The typical Kieran Tierney slide tackle, you know, you know the one I'm talking about where he just goes in with no fear at all, wins the ball every time. But. Again, young lad coming in, playing against a half-decent Turkish outfit. And yeah, he was just throwing himself in there, closing down the winger, winning the slide tackles. And it's like, oh, this this boy's got something, by the way. This, I mean, is a guy better watch his back here because uh, th this boy definitely looks like he's got a bit of potential and he certainly did have the potential. But this game, oh man, Steve-O, Effie Ambrose mm -hmm. did Effie Ambrose things. Yeah. So we got off to a stormer. Again, much like the Malmo game at home, 2-0 up early on in the first half. Lee Griffiths and Chris Coleman scored for us to put us two up. And then, just before half time, a long ball forward for Fenerbahce. Effie Ambrose tries to just cushion a header back to Craig Gordon and completely misjudges it. 
And uh, the Brazilian striker, Fern, Fernandão, I think his name was. Was it oh, Fernando? It's like Fernandão. He's in on goal. He just goes round the keeper and he scores to make it 2 1 right on half time. And then early in the second half, we lose another goal from a corner where Effie Ambrose was maybe marking Fernandão. He let him get goal side. He got a glancing header at the near post and it was 2 2. Oh. And the game fizzled out after that. And after two games, Steve, Celtic, who could have been on six points quite easily. We were yep. the situation we were in in Amsterdam, and then it'd be 2 0 up in Glasgow. We're only on two points after two games. It's a typical Celtic in Europe story, isn't it? Oh, totally. You know, it, it's funny you say that, and like talking about Ambrose. And see, see, the more you actually think about that, it, it's it's hard to get your head around how he stayed in our team for so long. Like, yeah, yep. actually, you know, yep. like seriously, we, we, we were things that broke that we just persisted with because it was it was mental. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, you know, it, it, as you say, it's it's the classic Celtic in Europe thing, and and listen, by all accounts, we have talked about how the team lacked an identity and stuff like that. But the manner in which we lost the two goals was it because you, you didn't have an identity? It was just just stupidity. Yeah, it was. you know that was that, that was essentially the kind of game that that probably would have panned out. Mm-hmm. Mistakes aside. Like the domestic games that we're talking about, where you, you didn't really have this great identity, you were just playing, but you'd done enough to win, and and it right. looked as if it was going that way, and then just as you say, total madness. Right. <laughs> so, That's it. Like a couple of minutes before half time, and a couple of minutes after half time, and I see the second goal. I can't call Ambrose too responsible. He is meant to be marking him and he lets him get goal side. But the first one is criminal. But, I mean, the first, criminal. One's unfor- the first one's unforgivable. You know, we, we get in a, a, a situation where you've got to be, you know, defending whatever you say is and, and you should be marking someone. Those are slight lapses in concentration, but the first one's just a blatant, idiotic move. Yep. <laughs> so... Oh. Funny enough, a couple of years later, Dedrick Boyata would do the exact same thing in a game against Bayern Munich, try to head the ball back to Craig Gordon in roughly the same position, head it right into, I believe, Serge Nabry or uh, Kingsley Coleman's path, and they would just go round the keeper and score, and it's like, what the fuck, man? I've seen this goal before, but I was Dedrick Boyata did at that time, but yeah, it's typical Celtic to shoot themselves in the foot in Europe. I say, we're in a position, we could have beat Ajax, we lost a goal with four minutes to go. And then we go and go 2 0 up against Fenerbahce. We could have been on six points, but no, we find ourselves on two points. But don't worry, guys. Don't worry, everybody. We've got a double header coming up against Mulder, the weakest team in the group. What could possibly, possibly go wrong here? What could? Well, I'll tell you what, everything, everything could go wrong. Because, yeah, this is where it all unravels. Despite domestically, we're on quite a good run at that point of like five or six wins on the bounce. We head out to Norway for the third group game. And, uh, yep, typical Celtic, we find ourselves 2-0 down in its damage limitation against a team with a much smaller budget. But then just uh, 10 minutes into the second half, Chris Commons picks up the ball in the edge of the area, does really well beating the defender, and then chips it over the goalkeeper neatly <coughs> to reduce the deficit, get it back to 2-1. We're back in the game, Liam. It's like, okay, brilliant. But then Celtic do what Celtic do best in Europe and shoot themselves in the foot. Something stupid happens. Literally 60 seconds after scoring that goal, they go up the park and it's Mohamed El Yanoussi that slides in at the back post and puts them 3 1 up. Uh, again, typical Celtic lane where you've read this book before, you've seen this chapter somewhere. It's like only we could do this. I see this all the time, and I know it may be because I'm a Celtic fan and I just have that woe always me attitude, but I genuinely feel like no team across all of Europe loses goals like we do in European competition. We lose the worst goals. Every single time, and we've done it again here. Get yourself back in the game. Sixty seconds later, you've completely switched off, and it's three-one again. But fuck off! <laughs> but you can you can relax with this team. That's what I was saying. It was an enjoyable time to watch Celtic. So I, I would mm. be watching that. I would be like late afternoon for me watching it in a bar. Those games, right? Start about like lunchtime, and actually take an extra a long lunch and all that. And you know, by the time you come, I felt like I'd been through trauma. You know, it's just like I'm on the edge of my seat for like 90 minutes, come back and work, I'm all wired up and all that. And it's like, what's wrong with me? Oh, no, I just saw something horrendous happen, you know. And look, they always found a way to. I, I saw that team, you just, you couldn't relax because you knew there was no discipline in that team. There was nothing mm-hmm. in that, there was no glue holding it together. You know, and I hope mm-hmm. he's talking about, I think Scott Brown's got a part to play in that as well. I mean, he was the captain, we put a lot of, 
We put a lot of stock in him as a captain. And him being the captain meant we never ever signed better players for that role. It was always Scott Brown's role because he was supposedly leading us. But he was disappointing that season. And if you look at what we needed, because what ended up happening on there, well, on the pitch day as well, strong captain sorts that out. Yeah. You know? So if you're talking about when Commons like throws a, you know, you know, just spits out the dummy, mm-hmm. walks off, you know, and the the, the, the quiz you're doing at the thing, I'm definitely on Ronnie's side on that. I thought mm-hmm. I thought what he did was just I thought it was mature, I thought it was unprofessional. But also mm-hmm. as well, it's like Chris Commons, pull it in, man. You know, you're shouting mm-hmm. at John Collins and Jenny and that there and Ronnie Dial, and it's like I mean, he's as vanilla crisps as I get, you know. It's like Commons, mm. you know, just it's like day on the park, and, yeah. and and I know he did it in that as well, but it was just like, you know, you, you're you know, old superstar. You're you're very lucky to come to Celtic. You mm-hmm. had never ever heard of him because he was, you know, he was lucky enough to be in that Scotland where yeah anybody could play a game, you know, <laughs> you know, some guys from England. So, yeah. yeah but, uh, it was very much on Ronnie's side. I was really disappointed. And I was disappointed in the whole team and the unity of the team that that could not have been kept indoors and that had to happen mm. very publicly. We get slaughtered yeah. for that. Keep, keep, you know? It's the equivalent of keeping it all indoors and posting it all on social media, isn't it? But yes, Steve, well, that's yeah. the next talking point, funny enough, because after we've gone three one down, Chris Commons gets subbed not long after. And then yeah. it happens the moment that it's all this is all the whole campaign's remembered for. Chris Commons does not take it too well. Obviously, he gets handed one of the tracksuit jackets, throws it aside, sits down. Well, he shouts at John Collins as he walks by, shouts at Ronnie Dyler, <coughs> sits down, but then he's still giving it to them both barrels. He's pointing up towards where the fans are sitting, saying, you know, listen to them, you know, giving them his opinion. So, again, I mean, obviously, uh, it's wrong the way that he's – you should never do it publicly. It should never, ever, ever happen that way. So he's definitely wrong in that aspect. Um, but something was very much wrong behind the scenes at Celtic, and that yeah. kind of gave the fans a little a little peek behind because there was a lot of theories, a lot of rumour that there were cliques in the dressing room that were working against Ronnie, and I think that gave the fans a massive sort of clue because um, mm-hmm. something was definitely wrong at Celtic that year, and you felt it in the style of play. As I thought about no identity and just how, like, you know, they, they weren't really fun to watch. So it felt like what Chris Common said... Maybe it needed to be said, but definitely not should have been done public. Um, mm-hmm. Keep it behind the scenes, by all means. Fucking have vent at Ronnie there. But the minute he did that in public, it was like, right, this is this is just going to go. Everything can go wrong now, can you know? This is going to go one way this season. Um, there's going to be absolute turmoil from this moment on, wasn't it? It was just yeah. a surreal moment to see, wasn't it? I think it. I think it truly marks the sort of beginning of the end in that downfall. You know, there's obviously, as you say, there's, there's rumours swirling about what's going on backstage and that. And I think that see whenever you look at it, you know, for where, what we had before moving into Dialer season one, season two, and that whole new idea and that sort of, I guess you'd say at the time, it was almost prototype Ange ball stuff where he was wanting to implement a, mm. a, a philosophy, quote unquote, and think long term. And it was new and fresh ideas. As again, we say, some of the execution it was turns out that it was very poor, but it was a radical change from what they'd had before. And I think probably the cliques and stuff is pretty accurate. I think it would be ignorant to say that it wasn't, because I think when you compare the development of where the team went, and then particularly the next season when Rogers comes in, mm-hmm. this is the sort of last vestiges of the kind of lad culture, if you yeah. want to call it that, yeah. that old school type of um, management, but it was. Guys, John was guys in the, the dressing room and Lenny types, you know, yep. no disrespect to the guys, all done a fantastic job, but just mm. a transition where they weren't buying into his ideas, you know, for season one, as it is, into season two, mm. those reservations become more deep set, as we've heard in all these sort of interviews that certain ex players have done and spoke about the time. And you know what? Listen, what Commons does, he's, as you say, he's sane. What probably needs to be said, mm-hmm. but he lets himself down, he lets right. his teammates down, he lets yeah. the club down. And then we're talking about a captain, we're talking about Scott Brown. Should mm-hmm. he have been, should somebody like Brown have been more stronger? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yep. But 
does that then buy into the fact that it says lad culture cliques is his mate mm -hmm. and he just takes a back seat because Aye. let's face it i think a lot of people you only need to look at the turnouts of the games and stuff right the, oh, well. the dialer yeah. thing there was no real buy in there the mm. players are seeing that and as we've seen managers all over the world have different leagues see if players become you know disillusioned with what's going on they, mm. they start to it was just fortunate we didn't really have much competition if we're honest at the time and we could muck our way through and still win games for the guy but mm. I think um, I, I, it's certainly something unsavory. It's not something I'd want to ever see no. again. Um, I'm kind of I'm I'm conflicted. Yeah, I agree with comments, but I don't agree with what he's done. Yeah, that makes sense. You know? No, that that does. I think both can be a true statement where there was something rotten at the club. Some he said what needed to be said, but he did it completely, completely the wrong way. But here's the interesting thing. I'll put this question to both of you. Just make it a one-word answer if you want. At that point in time, should Chris Collins have played for the club again, Liam? Yes. Yeah. Steve? -o? We needed them. We needed them. No, because I think that <laughs> we, we, even though Liam's saying we needed them, I think, I think we had enough in reserve to cruise through. And get mm -hmm. by your key objective, which was to win the league. Yeah. Um, and I just think that it, once I, I listen, when it's so public and it's so aggressive and it's so overt as that, right. for me at least, there's no coming back for that. You, it's a bridge you can't really patch. Ronnie's credibility was already flagging and it was piss poor. It just doubled down on that and it made him look significantly more weak and it made him look significantly more pathetic. And just for that reason alone, as I say, what he said and what he done, he was perfectly right in saying what folk had to say. But in terms of how it looked for the club, it just made him look more early in duck. And that's the reason why, for me, he shouldn't have played the rest of the season. See, the reason why I want to ask that is because I can remember the next game we played was Dundee United that weekend. And I went to Celtic Park that day fully expecting if Chris Collins plays, every time he touches the ball, he's going to get booed. I can remember the social media reaction on Twitter when the incident happened live and there was a lot of pro comments, a lot of fans very much on Commons' side there. And when I went to the stadium on the, the, the Saturday for the game or the Sunday against Dundee United, what Steve was saying there, that sort of mm. lame duck type thing where you just felt like Ronnie is sort of like that. He's just, he, he's a goner. He's finished now because Commons played against Dundee United scored twice in a 5-0 victory and didn't really get booed at all. There may be wee smatters of it here and there, but it seemed like there was more support in the stadium for Chris Commons after what he did. And realistically, any player that does that to a manager, a, a message should be sent. They shouldn't play for the club again. But we're just in that position. But Ronnie made himself look a very, very weak at that point by playing him, continue to play him. And yeah, it was. Um, I mean, maybe I'm giving benefit of the doubt here. Maybe they did have a word after it all and shook hands and buried the hatchet. But again, us fans didn't see all that part. We only see what's in front of us on the park. And you go from Thursday night, him screaming at him, to then Saturday, he does play him. Common scores twice and is kind of sending a message to the manager like, ah, you, you still need me. I'm still, I'm still one of the best players here at this club. It was, it was a weird experience because I say I fully went to the game that day expecting every time Commons touches the ball, you'll get booed, and it didn't really happen at all. Yeah. It didn't. It was weird. I, I mean, I think, so, as we said, it's because of what was going on. Like, listen, nobody's doubting that mm. the reaction is what you or I would do, mm. but it, it's, it's, you know, you've got to split it between being right fundamentally and being wrong in how you do it. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's 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 the, the one thing, unfortunately. You know, it's, that's why I'm saying yeah. I was conflicted over the, the, the sort of way it panned out. Mm. William, what were you going to say, sorry? I'll tell you what, one, the one way it did, uh, it did come out, we, we made that known. In the next season, he never kicked a ball for Rodgers. So that, that message was probably sent by the board and etc. There you go. But it was sent, yeah. <laughs> it was sent one year yeah. later, you know. Aye. It was, well, it was because he that. still plays his part. But I still did, just said the exact same thing. But Commons did end him at Celtic. Rogers remembered that, and that's why he didn't play him. He did. But see, so we're halfway through this European campaign, and the freakish thing is, Chris Commons is involved in 
pretty much every every game that we play in this campaign, he played five out of the six group games. He either scored or got an assist in every single one of them. He ended up being our most valuable player in a terrible European campaign. He ended up being the most valuable player out of the, the, the group stage games that we played. Surreal, surreal. But yeah, we go obviously from losing in Mulder, the 3-1 loss and Commons having that meltdown. They then come to Celtic Park and then beat us 2-1. El Yunusi scores again against us and a 40-year-old striker scored the winner. Chris Coleman's goal that night is actually a massive deflection. I think it's McGregor hits a shot for outside the area and it hits off Commons and deflects into the net. But the final game, I think it was win or bust where we had to get something on the board. I don't think we were even out at this point. We played Ajax and fixture number five at Celtic Park. And Cal McGregor gave us the lead with a phenomenal goal, but we capitulated in that one. Uh, ended up being 2 1 down. Well, we ended up losing 2 1. The the goal, the winning goal was remembered for Scott Allen dwelling on the ball a bit too long on the edge of the area, the Ajax area. They just dispossessed them, run right up the park, and they scored the winner. And by the way, just thought it was quickly in my head, the Molder game, another horrible moment for that is uh, Semenovic got injured, shock, early on in the game. Tyler Blackett came on as a sub and was so bad. He got oh, subbed man. off again in the second half, and that ends the ballad of Tyler Blackett in a Celtic shot, never to be spoken wow. of again. But yeah, after they lost to Ajax, well, we're out, we're out again. We go with Fenerbahce for the last time. It's sub the worst, isn't it? That's, that's not the worst in football. Oh, yeah, sub getting subbed is, is yeah, such a rare that's, thing, that's, but oh, it's terrible, terrible. But I, Tyler Blackett was horrendous that night. Uh, and uh, But we're out after five games. The last game against Fenerbahce in Istanbul's a dead rubber. We end up drawing 1-1. One, one. Chris Coleman scores in that one as well. But yeah, one each draw we finish on and overall for the campaign, it was a whopping three points. Bottom of the group, uh, a draw with Ajax, a draw with Fenerbahce, and, uh, two draws with Fenerbahce, two losses to Mulder and a loss to Ajax. Horrendous, horrendous group stage and uh, a massive, massive uh, divide in the camp, it seems. And even to see the fan base, I remember at the time there was a real sort of Fans who were on Dyla's side with it and fans who were on Common's side with it. It was quite a polarising one. And even in the chat, you know, I can see that Monty is very much like, nah, no sympathy for Dyla at all. Um, and then there's other ones that are sticking up for, you know, Dyla and so forth. So even to this day, that incident still causes a hell of a divide. Mm -hmm. But we will continue on to the final part. Because, yeah, the wheels come off the Dyla bus. We won it 2016. Despite... Aberdeen are still sort of keeping up with us at this stage. We are still in the League Cup semi-final. We are still top of the league. And realistically, we're probably going to win it. We know we're still going to win it. It may be a wee bit of a struggle, but we should get over the line, no problem. And of course, the Scottish Cup is still to play for us. So technically speaking, as 2016 started, still a treble on the table to be won. But of course, that didn't happen because quite early on in the... Uh, in January, obviously we had. I mentioned it at the start of the show. We did the, the the transfers. You know, a good January window really galvanised this team and galvanised the fans. Well, Colin Kazim Richards, Eric Sviachenko, and Paddy Roberts. Now, Paddy Roberts, we've talked about. He's he was phenomenal. He turned out to be absolutely incredible player. He did galvanise the sport. He got you off your seat. Sviachenko, he had his limitations, but he was a decent enough player. But yeah, Kazim Richards, say less said the better. But just after the window closes, uh, we have two disastrous results back to back where, again, it's just so evident that things are just not working to this team. We play Ross County in the semi final of the League Cup. Ross County, lowly Ross County. What could possibly go wrong against Ross County, guys? Well, we've been here before, unfortunately, with a semi final with Ross County. And yeah, just like they did in 2010, they beat us again. Gary McKay Stephen put us ahead after 20 seconds in that game. And I thought, man, so you're going to cakewalk 20 seconds? No bother. We're going to go on and canter this game. But no, I've just said that uh, earlier on. I'm going to say it again. Effie Ambrose did Effie Ambrose things. He gives away <laughs> a penalty and gets himself sent off, allowing Ross County back into the game. And in the end, <laughs> Ross County go on and beat us 3-1. Effie Ambrose, what am I like? Oh, man. oh Jesus, man. Yeah, Shocking day, started, that one. Man. I used to try and play FIFA, EA, FIFA against my son, and I had always had a loving FA Ambrose running in the wrong direction and just doing <laughs> stupid shit. What you can you account for? Oh man, yeah, that day, that oh. day was brutal. But I, they got back in. If I remember right as well, I'm pretty sure one of their goals, Craig Gordon gets fouled at a corner. I can remember him being absolutely raging with the referee, like he was getting held at the corner. Right. And when you see the replay, you're like, "Aye, there's definitely a case for it there." 
But even if there was a, another referee standing next to the post or if VAR was in play, probably wouldn't have got it anyway. Yeah. But yeah, they end up beating us 3-1 in the end and we're out of that. So it's like, oh, well, the double's still on the table. At least we can do that. But then we play Aberdeen in a league game just a few days later and we absolutely phone it in against Aberdeen up at Pataudry. A weak performance. Remember watching the telly and again, you're just like, this is so broken. It's so flat. There's no energy. The only player I felt that was trying that night was uh, Lee Griffiths. He scores a goal late on, a consolation in stoppage time, but we're already 2 0 down at that point. Aberdeen beat us 2 1. And I can remember Liam vividly that when the Aberdeen fans are chanting, there's only one Ronnie Dyler, it's like, you know, you've got a bit of a problem here, haven't you? When the Aberdeen fans are rubbing it in your face. <laughs> Fuck. That- Oh, the press, super scoreboard, Chris Sutton. At that point, everybody, you know, all the all the stuff on the chats, you know. And we, we knew Ronnie was done. He, he completely lost that dressing room, and you could tell. You know, and we figured, okay, well, the one thing that would probably get out of it would be a big game against Rangers if we were to draw them in a cup, and it would be uh-huh. all okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Funny, funny uh, you say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that would have made it good. I think that would have galvanised the team or oh, at yeah. least show us that we're going in the right direction. Because at that point, it was like, all right, what have we done? We've just missed an opportunity where we could have been like bringing in really, really potentially good youth players, like like what um, Ant has done with Bada and, and Jota and, you know, and, and stuff like that, embedding in a really good team that could compete in Europe and that, you know, not worrying as much about the Scottish League. And at that point, you could just sort of say, oh, Christ, we've done a Celtic here. We've completely wasted an opportunity to build on success, to build on having, like, okay, you know, just a wee bit of a free hit, more room, good budget. No, we never did it. And you could see it falling apart. And it's like, oh, Christ, we, we, you know, after all this, we're on par with a team that's coming up. You know, mm-hmm. and, and that was the big thing for me. That's what, that's what made me just like, oh, Christ. You know, it's really question why you support Celtic at times, and that was one of the times. And it was like you start, and that was when the boardroom was starting to take a lot of heat. Lau oh, was yeah. start to get a lot of heat. As well, I mean, I God had been there, a lot of people are aware, but now it was like, okay, you've you've paper cracks. You know, when, when I said, you know, would you play Chris Commons again after that? I would say, yeah, because I think Ronnie Dylas should have been gone after that European yeah. campaign because it wasn't going to get better. You. You just mm. seen it. He'd lost the players' respect, yeah, or he never got it, or something happened to fracture it. You know, they keep going on about this diet that that was like the major yeah. contributing factor. And it might have been why we were lethargic and less energy, but I don't know. It doesn't sound like the players, you know, um, em- embrace that sort of philosophy. You know, I'm sure John Collins didn't come up with this, you know, diet plan and fair back mm. at a woman's magazine. You know, you, you got, you know, like there are sports scientists and all that that have yeah. had this sort of stuff. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure some of it made sense, you know? Yeah. But anyway. Right. But you're saying about the bowl game, see, like, I can remember that. See that Aberdeen game? See when there was the moment when the Aberdeen fans were all chatting. I can remember the right. cameras panned in on the Celtic directors that were sitting at in the director's area up at Pataudry that night. And it was one of those, the commentators made a call out and like, oh, you know, they'll be hearing that right now. And, when I was watching it again, it's like you yeah. must be hearing this. Aberdeen fans are rubbing it in our face, and so you know, Patrick McGoggin says he made Aberdeen look like a freak because that victory put them three points behind us at that stage, and it was like, oh, this is it's not going well. But hey, don't worry, as Liam said, a game against Rangers, the victory over them that will sort it, that will galvanise it, and as fate would have it, after another few shaky results, and I say we've already talked about the Tom Rogic goal that got us the wee four point cushion. We've got a Scottish Cup semi-final coming up against Rangers, who are still in the second tier, albeit they're flying pretty high under the new dream team management of uh, Mark Warburton and Davey Weir. They're turning up at Ibrooks wearing Warburton's bread packets on their head. I don't even know what to say that again. Banter years, just crazy. They're on course to win the championship at the second time of asking. I think they've won the petrol tank cup at the fourth time of asking by that point. So yeah, a real team in forum, a real team to fear here. But, see, we were quite broken, so it was a bit of a nervy one going to Hamden mm-hmm. that day, and unfortunately, yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't be a good... It's one of these results that's still a, a massive blight in Celtic history, because uh, the first half, 
was an absolute siege. We, I, I don't know how we were only 1 0 down at the break. It was embarrassing to watch. I was there that day for it. Couldn't believe it, like what I was seeing in front of my eyes, because Kenny Miller put them 1 0 up in the first half and they could have yeah. easily had a few. Patrick Roberts also missed an absolute sitter. Do you remember back that, Steve? No, I was oh. coming across the back post. It was a shocker. Yeah. Oh. When I was sat at Hamden, I had a good view right down to that goal. And again, it's an open goal right in front of him. And he yep. just hits it right into the side netting. And it was just like, I can't believe he's missed that. It's like, oh my God. That just I don't think it, I don't think he recovered for that either for the rest of the game. Like, it yeah. really ate him up. It really, oh. really affected him. Definitely. Definitely did. I miss like that would, would affect a young lad, especially that fixture, you know, against yeah. against them of all people. But Saying so half time comes and we've got a chance to sort of like <laughs> rally and sort of figure out what the hell's going on. And incredibly, in the second half, Celtic did feel like a different team. They came out with like a different energy. And early on in the second half, Eric Sviachenko, absolutely. If, if you can get a no, I use the word thunder bastard, Liam. If you could have a header mm-hmm. described as a thunder bastard, this was one of them. He powers that one. That's one of those headers where he's, he's attacking that. It's like, get the fuck out of my way. Nobody's getting in my way for this header. He meets it brilliantly. Can has nobody's getting anywhere near two goalkeepers in wouldn't have stopped that one. His celebrations were iconic as well. He was he was loving that moment, wasn't he? And again, it's one of those you see a player who's come into the club, he's just scored against them. The celebration, you're like, okay. he gets it. He gets it. He he fucking knows what it means. He understands. Because right at that point, I was like, fuck, this guy's Fiachenko, man. He's he looks the business, but I was it was a real power header, wasn't it? I and especially as well, he wasn't the biggest guy in the park. I remember him, he was, I, I thought he was quite good today. Yeah. And I, I, I liked everything about him. I thought he's one of the players we were we were far too quick to get rid of him. I think we could have got more out of Eric Shevchenko and you know, to, to see what we replaced him with or what we tried to replace him with. I guess when he got to Rogers, Roger, he just wasn't in Roger's cup of tea. But I thought when he came in, he, I think he 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 was a positive. At that time, so I was looking forward to seeing what would go on with him. And and again, when you score a big goal like that, Hamden against Rangers, your rivals, and it's like, yep. again, you say, we, you know, big thunder bastard, you know, intent, <laughs> right? Getting it right in there. Ah, ah yeah, that always, you're always going to be a fan favorite. And so, you know, yeah. even f- for that alone, I was sad to see him go, you know, and I always oh, yeah. liked the way he talked about, you know, he yeah. always had a, a very fond, didn't his wife, I think his wife played with the women's team. She yeah, did. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, she did indeed. I something in the comments said the only reason like, kept him so fun. long is because of that. Only embracing Celtic, you know, and and that I, I would have seen him stay a little bit longer. I thought he was a good player for us. But um, oh, yeah, at that point, happy days. We're back in this at that point, you know. I and we, uh, we were the better team in the second half. It really was right. a game of two halves. We we had them on the ropes. We just couldn't find the the winning goal in the ninety minutes. So obviously, it goes to extra time. And not uh, long into the first period of extra time, Barry Mackay, fucking hell, man, fair play. It was a good goal, even though, naturally, yeah. you don't like to see any goals to them, but Jesus Christ, he unleashes it for about 25 yards, puts it right in the top corner, we're 2-1 down. But we find our way back in again, just after half time of extra time, Tom Rogic puts one into the net, uh, who we've talked about, obviously, earlier on. He would get a goal. Sadly, though, he's about 15 minutes away from uh, something pretty bad happening to him. But yeah, he does get his equaliser. But here's a wee forgotten thing. In the very last minute of extra time, we could have won that. Lee Griffiths tried to do his best Cristiano Ronaldo impression with a knuckleball free kick on the edge of the area. One of those ones where he hits it with the sort of top of his, uh, the top of his foot. West Fodderingham literally gets like a fingertip on it and puts it onto the crossbar. The ball bounces down in front of the line and he smothers it. If that ball goes in, we win 3-2. We go on to the final. Uh, and in my opinion, if Celtic had got to the final that day, I think we win the Scottish Cup because Stokesy and Henderson would be able to play for Hibs and things yep. would have been very, very different. But in this case, though, it didn't go in. Uh, the game goes to two, ends 2-2. Two, two. Now, me personally, the last time I'd seen a penalty shootout in person was the Spartak Moscow game in 2007. I remember saying to my dad at the time, they're fun to watch on TV, but I never ever want to live through one again in person in a stadium. And uh, of all the teams for my second one to be against, it was against them. And it was like, I can remember when the full-time whistle went, I just kind of turned around with sort of like, just like a big breath out, like an exhausted breath. And it was a guy looking at me in the row behind who had the exact same expression, like, I, I can't do this. I, I can't 
watch this. This is this is torture. A penalty shootout against them. It's just it's proper squeaky bum time. And yeah, unfortunately yeah. for us, McGregor. Scott missed. Brown should have won that penalty. Scott Brown. She, he should have won that. Scott Brown should have won that penalty shootout. Aye. And his penalty's pathetic. Do you think you that know? was one of those cases, Steve? We are. We've seen Ronaldo do it where he wants to take the fifth penalty because he's got this idea that I'll get all the glory here. And Jake Scott Brown maybe did something like that where he thought, I'll take the fifth one and then I can get the glory and stick it to them. No, I, I, you know, it's hard to tell. Like McGregor hits the bar, doesn't he? He does, McGregor um, hits the bar. So, right? you know, see me actually look at the, the penalties in general, they're, they're pretty piss poor mm-hmm. across the piece. Yep. But certainly for me, just Browns, it's, it's less to do with, as you say, I'll do this, I'll do that. It's just the general execution is absolutely terrible. It takes this kind of lacklustre yep. run up and it's kind of like there's no real pace in it. Aye. And he just kind of like you know, sweeps the ball and it's yeah. there's no real conviction in it. And, and he almost looks surprised, like, oh, I missed that. Like, really? You think? <laughs> you know? And, and and that's that's the thing. Like, but hindsight's a great thing. But he, he for me, it shouldn't have went as far as it, it, it did. Yeah. Because there was more, there was Brown being the for example, capable players turning up that just mm. didn't happen for them. Yeah, it was. I remember the penalty you're talking about. There was a sort of like, I don't know if it was, arrogance is the word, but again, he's in a position to win the shootout and. Yeah, he, he fluffs that chance and then it goes on. So he, do you know who missed a penalty for Rangers that day? Tavernier. Aye. Stuck, aye. stuck one over the bar, just like Rogic did. Aye, but it gets forgotten about. Because and and of see if you actually think of some of the guys that took penalties for them, though, as well. If you want to look at it in, in terms of as footballers at that time and experience, they had a lot of experienced guys taking up. I can't remember his name. Is it, is it like it begins with a Z or something? The, 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 um, the young guy, was the, the black guy. They had on all the very skill, young guy. The skillful player from Tottenham. Yes. Oh, yeah. I he scores an about. absolute top of penalty. And he's a young guy that's getting yeah. his next to zero experience. You're putting your money on these young guys missing. I think does, does Nicky Law no take a penalty or am I just imagine? Nicky like? Law took one and Clark took one. One of them missed I, and one of them scored. I mean, I but look at the guys who've got to take penalties. Then you look at the guys who've got to take penalties. If I remember, Mikel Lustig took the best penalty of a lot. His was an absolute rasper. It was one of those ones he's a, t- a defender coming forward. You're like, oh, God. Yeah. You know, you're always nervy. But he pinged that right in the top corner. Like, oh, what a, what a, I never doubted you, Mikel. Never doubted you at all, mate. <laughs> Screamer. But yeah, of course, all what happens is Rangers find themselves 5-4 up at that point in the shootout and up steps uh, Tom Rogic. Guy obviously scored to keep us in it. He blazes it over the bar, sadly, and uh, unfortunately he's written into infamy with that one. At the time, obviously things would be uh, definitely mended over the next few years, but at that point in time, it was like, oh man, after the season he's had, and uh, yeah, they would go and miss that penalty, and it gets them the the victory over us. Naturally, it was a, a shocker for us. A few days later, Ronnie Dyler announces that he's stepping down. Some fans say, oh, he was doing the honourable thing. No, no, he was told by the club that yeah, you're going, you know. I, th- I mean, I've said this before. I think the way his, who followed on from his successor left the club has kind of elevated Ronnie and how he left the club because uh, obviously Brendan Rogers snuck out the back door like a thief in the night and then people have went back to I mean, Ronnie did the right thing the way he left the club. No, Ronnie was effectively told you're going. Yeah. It wasn't a case that he... The press conference was set up and he spoke at the press conference saying, making it sound like, oh yes, I'm, you know, I've, it's just not working and I'm doing this for the club's good. And it's like, no, 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 you, you, you've been told by the club. Because as the story goes, apparently Dermot Desmond wasn't too happy after the game. And supposedly there was an incident in one of the director's boxes with the, the Rangers directors. Again, this is all, if this actually happened, it's one of these good... It makes for a good story, guys. Supposedly they were being a bit arrogant, you know, rubbing it in their faces, and Dermot Desmond had told Peter Lawwell on the board to get the absolute best manager that they could, and as fate would have it, um, we certainly went out and got that. But before that happens, Ronnie still has a title to wrap up. We need to keep that in mind. There is still a few league games to go, but after the loss to Rangers, it did feel like the the, the last few years. It wasn't like it was a lame duck, a lame duck. Essentially, you're just like, we're going to win it. 
And we did. We wrapped it up by beating Hearts at Tynecastle. They put us nine points in front, and the goal difference was so much. There's no way with three games to go, Aberdeen are going to make that up. But just for good measure, we beat Aberdeen in the next league game, and that made it official. We were champions again. But yeah, as it turned out, just after the season finished, usually you would think, right, Celtic, new manager on the horizon. Uh, what's going to happen here? You know, a bit, of, a bit of uncertainty around the club, and given how Celtic take a wee bit of a... They, they drag their heels a wee bit with some things. No, no, no. Within the first few days of the season ending, all these rumours came out that Brendan Rodgers was Celtic-bound and on the eve of the Scottish Cup final, which I still think to this day was a deliberate move from us that we timed this perfectly to try and steal the headlines for the weekend. Uh, we announced Brendan Rodgers would be the Celtic manager on the Friday before the uh, the Cup final. And uh, again, Celtic would have the last <laughs> laugh again on this one, I think, because... Yeah. What happened in the cup final? Well, Rangers managed to become the answer to a pub quiz question for years to come. Who ended Hibbs' drought of Scottish Cups? It was Rangers 114 years to be and waited on that trophy, and along came Rangers to give it to them. A quite epic final, to be fair. At first, yeah. I was kind of not really feeling it. Well, I was like, I don't know if I want to watch this, you know. But after the Rogers announcement, I was like, I'm feeling quite galvanized now. I'm going to watch this cup final. And what I think Rangers went two one up quite late on, but it was two mm -hmm. late goals for Stokesy and uh, Gray. Went it David Gray scored, yep. but it was Hedder. I Henderson's corner. But yeah, all's well that ends well for that season. So Celtic, uh, okay, we went to the title. And then the day when it comes to Ronnie, I think it's fair to say he had a lot of good ideas. He's definitely one of football's good guys. He talks about the club still positively to this day, just for many different reasons. It just wasn't going to work long term he came in he contributed two titles along the way to that nine in a row run and that can't that can't be forgotten Liam at the end of the day it's still part of that run of titles so for that we still need to always you know tip the cap to Ronnie and say well cheers for the efforts mate but ultimately it didn't work for him I'll, I'll always look back at Ronnie fondly I think I think for us it was a step in the right direction it just didn't it just didn't work out I remember this, you know, a lot of social media groups and stuff I was on. We were looking for a manager that would come come in from outside of Scotland that had some sort of progressive values in his CV that he could actually, it was more like a science of football, and he could take us to that next more European type stage where we could get sign those type of players, but also have them flourish within our system as well. And I think that set it up very, very nicely. I don't know if if uh like it might have been too much for Brendan Rodgers to come in and transition from a, a Neil Lennon team mm, to yeah. a Brendan Rodgers team. You know, at least Ronnie had sort of set up some of the markers for what he was trying to do and about what modern football was about. And obviously that was acknowledged as well, that it wasn't a total failure because the Manchester City group, um, they got him right away. He ended up in uh, showing up in New York with, a, with the Manchester yeah. City franchise. And won them yep. a cup as well. And so I, I think retrospect, I, I look back at Ronnie. There was nothing I disliked about the guy. I thought he was a likable mm -hmm. guy. I thought the media yep. gave him a hard time. Hard, yeah, hard did. time. And I also thought Scott Brown, our captain, could have done a lot more to help him in that as well. And and I think you have to look at that. I, you know, I, I, was, I was disappointed in, in our leadership on the park as well, like our senior players didn't sort of embrace Ronnie's philosophy, left left them out and and yeah, and it, and it just had to run his course. We had to get rid of him. You know? And Steve O, you look like a man that likes a bit of uh football, sort of like poetry, a bit of romance in football, a, a, a real good story. Well, as for Tom Rogic, we talked about earlier, he missed that penalty at that end of Hamden. Fast forward a year, and he's scoring the winner exactly. in the cup final at that same end at Hamden. To wrap up the Invincible treble, the perfect end yeah, for it. And I say they, no, cool you know, Tom, Tom Rogic scores that penalty that day. Things could have been different. Celtic could go on and win, beat Hibs the final. Ronnie ends up with a double. Does he get sacked? Does Brendan Rodgers happen? It's one of those, be careful what you wish for, because they mocked Rogic and they laughed at him when he missed that. Mm -hmm. But hey, him missing that ended up being one of the mm -hmm. worst things that could have happened for them because of what came over the next few years. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I do love the story of you know, um, for Tom Rogic in particular, where he goes from that, missing the penalty at that end of the pitch at Hamden, to scoring the winner in the cup final a year later. It's a phenomenal moment. And 
one of the best moments in Celtic history without a shadow of a doubt. We have actually covered the 2016-17 season somewhere in the Nostalgia series, so if you ever wish to go back and watch it, feel free to do so. It is out there for your viewing pleasure. Now, guys, that wraps up the Ronnie second season. We've got a wee bit of trivia to do before we finish up. Uh, so if you remember at the start, yes, I did ask. I said, Motherwell achieved something rare during this season. They came to Celtic Park and beat us in a domestic game. We don't tend to lose many domestic games at Celtic Park. So I was looking for the 10 other teams that have beaten Celtic in a domestic game at home since 2010 to present day. 2010? Yes. Wow. Some of these names will surprise you. Right. Well, Rangers have beat oh, some. Yeah, I mean, Rangers. Rangers is the, the very Let's just get that right out of the way. Yeah, now. Yeah. Get, get them out of the way. <laughs> just, yeah. It's, it's what that does. Livingston beat us. Oh, no. Hearts. No. Hearts have beat us. Not since no. 2010. Hearts have on a really bleak run against us. We've lost plenty of times at Time Castle, but they've not right. beat us since 2009 in Celtic Park. Uh, let me think here. This is a toughie. Think of it. When you go, Steve, because I'm just going to start shooting out teams soon. Ross County. Ross County, yeah. Ross County beat us in the, uh, the COVID season that we don't uh, kind of talk about. Remember the riots after the Ross County game outside the stadium? The Sharks. <laughs> the Sharks. Yeah, the Sharks. Aye. Ross <laughs> County beat us. Yep, that's one. Right. 2010, I think. St. Mirren? St. Mirren again, COVID season, yep. They beat us. Shane right. Duffy had an absolute disaster class that day, yep. No, don't say that. I know. It's hard to believe. <laughs> I understand it's hard to believe, but yeah. Um, St. Mirren is correct, yep. Oh, um, <sighs> Hubs. Hibs, yeah. Hibs beat us in the first team. I was to say Hibs. I was, I was Under going to... Mowbray. Tony Mowbray was manager and they beat us. Anthony Stokes scored the winner that night for Hibs. Then signed for us in the next, the next transfer window. Okay. Getting there. Is, this, is it league only right. by domestic? I mean, the domestic. Domestic. So, also cup as well. Yep. Mm. Greenock. That, that bing couldn't have been timed any better when you asked me that question and it was almost like a bing moment it, when you just did it, that. Greenock, did I get beat off Greenock? Greenock Walton is correct, yeah, but the timing of that was fantastic where you, the, the penny <laughs> sort of dropped to what I'd asked. Yep, domestic. Right. Um, Kelly. How many we got left? Kelly. Kilmarnock. Yeah, Kilmarnock. Yeah, Kilmarnock beat us and... I might have been after we beat Barcelona and... <laughs> We definitely had a shocker of a result <laughs> after we. Ever. Aye, that's that season under Lenny. We were great in Europe, but we had some shockers domestically. But we definitely had how, how many win? You've got one, two, three, four, five. So you've got another one, two, three, four, five to get. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to get a week in cups. Dundee United. Dundee United, United, United never beat us no. well. No, not in, terms, no. not in the two thousand. This period, two thousand ten to twenty twenty three. Motherwell, Motherwell were included. I gave you that as a freebie. I said oh, the ten other teams other than Motherwell. That's how that's my fucking mind sawzled. So there you go. Mm. Yeah. Cops, cops, cops. We keep do, no. It's at home. We've got to say Clyde. That was away, wasn't it? Clyde was away. away. No way, aye, it's all Celtic Park, this one. Um, the two, three, all the ones that are left are all ones that are in the league. It wasn't any cup games, they were all in the league. So try and think of teams that have played in and around the Premier League since 2010. And just as Leeds Inverness? Said, Inverness is one of them, yes. Inverness did beat us, aye, at Celtic Park. Mm -hmm. I think that may have been in Ronnie's six season. No Partick Fistle, no. No, no Partick. He's only need one, two, three more. Only three. There's one left Steve on here, which honestly, if you remember this one, this is... Like, you'll Edible. do well. You'll do Dundee? Well. No, not Dundee, no. Gretna? 
Oh, no great. That would have been 2008. That would have been outside yeah. of this period because they were only in the, the league for one season, weren't they? <laughs> um, uh, try to think of teams that are no longer in the league still. Uh, Hamilton. Hamilton Academical is correct. They beat us 1 0 in bad. Ronnie's first season, I think. It was, was it Ali Crawford, the a youngster that had they had that was quite promising. I think he scored the winner, but it was it was either either Lennon's last season or Ronnie's first season. It was that era, but I they beat us 1 0 at Celtic Park. Yeah, Hamilton fine. Academical. So you've got two more to get. I'm quite surprised it won, even though I Chris is saying Ali Crawford scored it. What is I? 2010. Dunfermline? No, no Dunfermline, no. That would have been further back, wouldn't it, actually? Right, aye. There's, there's one that's quite a surprise that you've not guessed them yet. Really? Mm. Falkirk? No. No. <laughs> if you think about the, what we've just discussed, 2015-16 season, and think of the teams that were hunting us down at the top of the table. Aberdeen? Aberdeen. You said Aberdeen? Aberdeen. Oh, right. No, I've never said Aberdeen yet. Aberdeen beat us in, oh. beat us in a league game and a cup game, but the, the league game is an infamous one at the end of the 2018 season where we lost 1-0, allowed Aberdeen to finish second, Rangers third. And Shea Logan was doing Shea Logan things after the game oh, and being a wido and Major Boyata was ready to batter him at the end of the game. <laughs> remember? So there's one more to get, um, which is I'm not even surprised. It's one of these middle of the road I'm, ones. I'm checking out. I'm done. I can't I think. Done, Put it this way, they've Here had quite mate. a successful decade with the trophies that they've won. St. Johnson. St. Johnson. St. Johnston. Yeah, St. Yeah, Johnston. Right. That, that, yeah, that was too easy. I could clear. Thank you, though. Ibs, St. Johnston, <laughs> Kelly, Inverness, Aberdeen, Morton, Hamilton, Ackies, Rangers, both versions, I guess you could say. St. Mirren, Ross County, and obviously I gave you Motherwell as part of the question. That's the 11 teams, clubs that have uh, beat us um, in the, uh, at Celtic Park in a domestic game since 2010. Doesn't happen too often, but I, Hamilton, Ackies, and Greenock Morton on there in that illustrious list. So that wow. wraps up the second Ronnie Dyla season. Next week, as I said, nostalgia is going to be all about League Cup finals against Rangers and specifically because we've got 2009 and 2019. So we're going to concentrate on both of those finals, talking about them, what was going on at the time. We'll look at the runs to both Cup finals, uh, say we'll look at all the, the stories around it and obviously go through the game because uh, 2019 in particular should be a fun one because uh, I think many, many of us Watched it from behind the couch at times because it was an awkward game to sit through. Yeah. Uh, so that'll be a fun one. And 2009 is a bit of a, a weird one because it wasn't a particularly successful season, Stratton's last one. That was like the only high point, I guess. We had Darren Adi, yeah. an unlikely cup final goal hero that day. So that'll be interesting to talk about. Uh, but yeah, that's the plan for next week's nostalgia. As for what's coming up on the bus this week, Russell will be back tomorrow for PMP for the Aberdeen game, him and Terry and whoever else is joining them. Uh, but that'll be happening tomorrow evening after the game. And uh, Sunday, I believe, Sunday Blair will be there. If there's a Sunday session happening, I'm not sure. It just kind of happens sort of on a whim. We just uh, decide to do one. And then we're back to Monday again. The Monday Club will be back. And I have got a belter of a question for Sutton Death on Monday night. I'm looking forward to that one. It will uh, it will really catch them out. So that'll, that'll put them through their, their paces. But guys, if you've enjoyed this wee chat tonight. Yes. I've much fun in the shit. Good stuff, good stuff. Because it was one <laughs> of these reasons I was putting off and putting off. I think it's uh, Kieran that's in the chat, Kieran McFadden. He said something the other week about Phil so doesn't want to do Mowbray and Barnes season. I will do them. But yeah, Ronnie's second season was one of the ones where I was like, oh, I've got to do it. I've got to do it at some point. Might as well do it now. But I've still got a few on the list where I'm like, oh, really? I need to do <laughs> I will get around to those yeah. ones eventually, but yeah, we'll, that's for another time. But next week, it's all about League Cup finals against Rangers, so we'll be doing that. So join us in, and we are out of here for the night, guys. Thanks for everybody watching. Remember, hit the like, comment, share, subscribe, go to Pie Sports and buy some pies, buy the shot, do all the good stuff that we like on the channel, and we shall catch you later. I mean, you've all that stuff at the start, you know, they won't be playing Tina Turner on the coach on the way home, will they? Uh, some of his comments about me deliberately trying to...
to cause contra controversy. Well, I work in the media now. And you've got someone sitting there next to you who's an embarrassment to the media profession. He's an apologist. He's a charlatan. He's a ranger's puppet. He's a cheerleader. That's what he is.